Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 186, Dog Days AMA. I'm Sean, your host, and here with me live is the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, helping you make your game nights better. We record Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash Tabletop Bellhop, and it would be awesome if you joined us. So I just got back to Windsor earlier today, like like within half an hour of now and <laughs> after a bit of a break. So um, we're taking a little easier on ourselves tonight by hosting a live AMA and answering questions from our chat room live. After that Q&A segment, we do have a review of Point Salad from AEG, followed by our usual week in review where we finish scenario two of the Ghost Betwixt. And while Deanna and I got in quite a few games while out of town. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Up first, a comment on Robotech on the tabletop video where we go through the history of all the Robotech games that have been and are out there. Bob Drummond comments, same as you, I bought the Palladium books just to read. And I am sure we are not the only ones. Uh, despite what people thought of the rules for the Palladium system, and yes, I know there's fans out there. I'm not trying to bash them. They just weren't for me. Palladium and, and the Palladium as a company did a ton of work to expand the Robotech lore and to document it. And I've got to thank them for that. Thanks for the comment too, Bob. Next, a comment on our Ghost Betwixt unboxing from Chris Lundgren, who says, this looks awesome. Thank you for sharing. Well, tune in later in our Bellhops Tabletop segment to hear more about this modern dungeon crawler. Now, Chris also commented on our topic of low-cost and no-cost games to say thank you for sharing this video. I love basic fantasy RPG, and it's so worth it. It really is. Uh, thanks for both those comments, Chris, actually. Um, I got to say, for the price, basic fantasy really can't be... It's it's under five dollars for a full soft cover role playing rule book. Uh, this is a F20 game. So fantasy D20 based game that has very strong original D&D feel, but uses some of the modern 3.5 mechanics like every ascending armor class and always wanting to roll high it is a really solid OSR system for a ridiculously low price. And the splat books are also just as cheap. Well, next, a quick comment on our Warhammer Fantasy roleplay review from Martin Voss, who said, I still don't have this. I should fix that. You should, Martin. Go for it. Just use one of our affiliate links. Thanks for the comment. Now, I've got one for Sean here, because it's on our Eight Superheroes RPG article on the blog. Matthew H. Iskra writes, thanks for the list. There are some that I would indeed take a look at. Your take on Champions is quite true, and perhaps I should return to it. Well, thanks, Matthew. Champions certainly has a wealth of fans out there, and there's plenty of content for it, with 800 items <laughs> on Drive -through RPG, uh, as for, for Champions right now. Well, let's wrap up with two comments on our Scythe review from some regular commenters. Okay. I'll start now. Phil Hatfield writes, I'm curious, how long was your longest game of Scythe ever? And Chris Groff comments, you're probably right in that this game does get better with repeated plays, but I was not a fan of a couple of games I played, and it wasn't like it. I was in it with sharks. Oh. I just don't like it. So yeah, maybe I could learn to like it, but I think that would require, as you said, playing this more and keeping it in rotation enough to learn the nuances and the feel that feels more like work than fun when there are plenty of other games out there that are fun right out of the gate. Yeah, very true. Well, thanks for the comments, Phil and Chris. Uh, to answer Phil's question first, the longest game of Scythe ever was six to seven hour range. I don't know exactly when we started, but I do know it was more than six hours later and close to seven, if not over, when we finished. And Chris is right on. Um, deciding to learn and enjoy Scythe is a dedication. It takes some work, and it's totally cool if your group isn't up for that. And as Chris is... Right, there are plenty of other games out there that are fun right from the box, and I totally get it. Um, if you follow Eric Lang on Twitter, it's funny because you can see him transition from I make heavy games to games need to be fun the first time you sit down and play them. 
And this is definitely not one of those. This is one of those heavier games that really rewards system mastery. And just like Chris, I didn't enjoy it when I first played it. That said, I do think the work is worth it in this case. But not every game is for everyone, and that's awesome. Oh, well, that's where we are going to stop tonight. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. And now I got to find myself. There we go. Just one announcement before we move on. So just a reminder, we are not going to be here next week uh, and possibly the week after it ends up as well. So next week on September 7th, I'm having dental surgery and I don't expect to be in any shape to record based on any past experience. Of now, this will, of course, impact our release schedule as far as podcast episodes and reviews. So you should still be able to expect the unboxings to keep rolling out because we've got plenty of them. And man, I've got more. I came home to a stack. I was surprised by that. Um, as well as uh, we've got a, um, what do you call it? Reboxing. We've got an insert build to release. So you should be able to expect those. Um, and the unboxing is because we generally record five or six at a time. We also, uh, we have that boxing insert that will be a good fill-in for a review, at least as far as YouTube content goes. Yeah, as for the blog, you probably won't see as much. And now I will note that Sean actually has a conference to attend. So we may not be able to record the week after. So we'll see if that's possible. Yeah, I, I think good. ideally, I mean, if we just slap in a review and do a uh, a game, a list episode, that's where I can kind of, you know, just sit down yeah. and, and follow well, up, follow yes. the bouncing ball. Sean, Sean will basically be doing what I did today and just getting home in time to record. So that's my if goal. we can pull it off this week, maybe we can do it in two weeks. Just a heads up, we may not. Next week, no. September 7th, no show. Uh, September 14th, we might cancel. We'll see. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. Uh, so tonight, I've been out of town for a little while. I didn't have a lot of prep time. I couldn't do a lot of research. So what we're going to do is we're going to get those questions right here, live from the awesome folk in the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. We like to do one of these AMA episodes every month or two as a good way to interact with you fine folk, as well as giving us a bit of a break prepping questions and answers. So, which is useful because like, seriously, I, I, like, I knew I was going to cut it close. I didn't think I was going to walk in the door a couple minutes before we go live. <laughs> so I do apologize. You know, my hair is a little disheveled this week. Alrighty. So uh, now is your chance chat room to uh, get in any questions you may have. They can be gaming related or not. This is an AMA after all. Now, one of the things I did not have time to do is we always ask our Discord if they have any questions. I did. So if the Discord have anything, Sean will have to grab those. I haven't seen. It. Now, I am going to start with one from someone we uh, we had some comments from earlier. So to get us started, I have a question from Chris Lundgren, who is a fan who frequently comments on our stuff on social media and YouTube. We highlighted one of their questions before. And it is, what is your favorite, if you have one, Star Trek board game or miniatures game? Have you and I actually played a Star Trek game together? Uh, an RPG, but never a board game, no. Actually, it's, it says game, so <laughs> honestly... We, we have I, played a we Star have Trek played, RPG. And I gotta say, that's up there. That was really up there. That was one of the best RPG sections we ever had. So the game we are talking about is FASA, F-A-S-A, FASA Star Trek, the first edition. Not even the second edition, not the Star Trek Three Starship Combat Simulator, but the first printing box set, which I bought off eBay, which is completely different than what I was going to say before Sean mentioned that. So FASA Star Trek was number one. Um, I have no idea if you can find this. It's a D100 based fantasy role, fantasy role playing game. Sorry, sci-fi role playing game um, set in the 1E Star Trek that was published before Next Generation even existed. Now, there is a Next Generation source book for this that came out later. Um, it very much was one of the first light pass systems. So like people like to talk about travelers light pass system that this had this. So of course you were going to Starfleet Academy and you tried to see how far you got through the Academy, how many years you were in there. And you made all these little die rolls to see where you went. And what I loved about that game was its combat system that I assume at this point inspired XCOM. Because it was one of those systems that based on a couple of your stats, you got so many points to do things, but it was super tactical. So it was like turning 45 degrees was 0.5 points and pulling your phaser was three points and taking two steps forward was another set of points. So I have to say probably my favorite Star Trek 
game is fastest Star Trek first ed. Fair enough. Now, it did say board game or miniatures game. Miniatures game, I would have to say Starfleet Battles. I will admit it's all because of nostalgia and fond memories and people geeking out about the game for years. So the first time I ever played Starfleet Battles was at a a, com- a board game convention here in Windsor, Ontario that was held at the University of Windsor. And I met some dude. This is this is where it gets creepy. Um, I met some dude. I don't remember his name even. Big dude. And we were hanging out. We got along and we hit it off. And he's like, come up to my room and play Star Trek with me. And he had, like, back then they rented out because it was in the summer. It was at the university. The dorms were rented out so people could pay, like, 30 bucks or whatever to stay overnight. And I went up and we played on the floor because... <laughs> The room was so small that there were two bunks and no table. And we were both laying on the beds, leaning over and moving chits. And and I just remember it was like my ship versus his ship and like spending six rounds figuring out where, like, where the missiles went. And I remember picturing Wrath of Khan with when they fired the torpedo and it's flashing off into the cloud and seeing that with chits and like my brain at that time. You know, this is this is 90s, maybe 80s. I think this was 90s. Probably it had to be 90s by this point. I was still pretty young. And I'm like, I remember going, oh, my God, this feels just like Star Trek. And it was the whole thing where it was, you know, the the impulses and spending energy to move your thing. And it's impulse three. What happens? Well, the torpedo gets closer. OK, it's impulse four. What happens? OK, your shields have gone up. Oh, it's impulse this. And I loved it. The problem with that game is I had a great time that night because whatever big dude who brought me back to his room name was taught me how to play and i had a great time so then years later i picked up the box set like the original and someone had like all the expansions in it and deanna and i sat down to learn that game and props to big dude because man i don't know who can learn it so then years later they came up with federation commander which is a simpler version still like like unfathomably complicated and then they came up with like i don't know it was like a little booklet learn to play And that was like, I kind of made sense. So Deanna and I sat down and tried to play and we actually had fun that game, but like we never went back to it. So, so I don't know. I, 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 I I would love to, to get more into it, but I'm just saying Star Star Trek, Starfleet Battles, the original marking off the things, spending your energy, marking off your engines. Like I had a lot of fun with it, though. I only really had a small amount of experience with it. Um, Better is I think it's called Star Trek Fleet Captains, which I have to thank a local gamer for getting me into. And that was the ripoff of X-Wing. And maybe I'm being mean by calling it a ripoff, but there was an Attack Wing, Dragon, Dungeons & Dragons, and there was a Star Trek one. That was actually really solid, but I only played it once. By the time I played it, it had already gone out of print, so I was really tempted to pick it up. And in X-Wing, what matters the most is what upgrades you put on your ship. You pick a pilot, but your pilot really just determines how good your ship is. The pilot doesn't do much. And then you buy a bunch of upgrades. Whereas the Star Trek attack wing was all about your crew, which, man, is like talk about theme between Star Wars and Star Trek. You, It was all about your crew. You could do boarding actions. There were ways to not just shoot each other. And it was really neat, but I only played once. So that's probably going to be my second favorite miniature game. But I haven't played many. Board games, I've got to go with Ascendancy. Star Trek Ascendancy, the big, I guess you'd call it 4X. It was a three-player only game when it came out where asymmetric, the Federation's going around trying to proselytize and convert people to join the Federation. The Klingons are going around trying to conquer people. And the Romulans are just trying to be sneaky and subvert everyone and take over everything through subterfuge. And that was what came in the base game. And then they put out like the Ferengi expansion which had totally different rules and added rules for money that weren't even in the game before because of the Ferengi. And then they came up with a, a Borg expansion, which allowed four players. But what you could do is you could have the Borg as a fourth player, even if you played with three players. And many people call it Star Trek in a box, and I've got to agree. It is the most, you are moving your fleet, you're playing a faction in Star Trek you'll ever get. Honorable mentions to the Star Trek version of Castle Panic, which I think is called Star Trek Panic. I'm not positive, but you're playing your typical panic game where you have your, it's, it's castle defense. You have your castle in the middle Star and Trek. you're drawing chips from the bag 
and you're putting the chips into various hexes or sectors around you, and they're constantly moving in, and if they eventually hit you, you take damage or whatever, right? Um, but it's Star Trek, and in the middle is the Enterprise, and it's a full 3D cardboard Enterprise. And then you have plastic shields you put around the outside, and you're doing things like turning the ship and firing the phasers and trying to tower defense it. And it's really well done, but it's long. And it was just too long. Like, it was just too long and too complicated and hard. And I want to love it. But I, I think with the right group, if I get it, like, I have a feeling if Sean came down and we played and we, we got into the Trekkie mood, we'd probably have a good time. But we're like group of gamers who are yes and no into Star, Star Trek. It did not go great. So interestingly, Castle Panic is a 1.6, whereas yeah. Star Trek Panic is a 2.26. Uh, yeah no, no that, <laughs> so that it's, sounds it's, right it's definitely that step up uh you know if you're expecting castle panic there is definitely a big jump uh from one to the other yeah uh and I, it's another it's expecting... an extra 30 minutes too it's a castle yeah, panic is a 60 minute game star trek panic is a 90 minute game i would say it was a double that when we played like it was like three hours the first time we played and i'm like i want to like it it seems good and i gotta say i love the look of it and they had some really neat stuff where they had overlays for as different parts of your ship got damaged. It looked like it was on fire. Oh, it's no longer on Amazon. I wonder if they pulled the license, Deanna's saying. Yeah, there's only one version. It's only, it was only ever released in 2016. Well, I have a copy. Maybe someone will offer me $220 <laughs> for it. Oh, yeah. Those are my favorite Star Trek. You know what? I'm going to keep talking about Star Trek just for a bit. Um, there are a bunch of terrible ones. The the roll, the rolling one was bad. Um but uh, a shout out to the what's what's the the new universe called the Kelvin universe that was called the Kelvin universe. Oh, that's I, a new track. I know. I forgot. I don't know. I know it'd be whatever the director's name is. I thought that was Kelvin. No, the Kelvin universe. Um, the Kelvin universe one. I th it, maybe I'm wrong on this. Whatever the new track, new track, whatever you want to call it. Um, Chris Pine track, whatever <laughs> Pine track. I've heard it called. Uh, they put out one called Star Trek Expeditions. Oh, yeah, okay. Kelvin time. Is Kelvin. I was right. Sure. All right. I, I'm not a Star Trek fan. As yes, you can tell. obviously. <laughs> I am. Yeah. I, 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 I am as much a Star Trek fan as I am a Star Wars fan. And everyone knows how much. I just don't, I don't get enough reason to talk about Star Trek, I guess. Um, that was fantastic, but it was all about away missions. And it was really well done. Like I it used Hero Clicks figures, but they, they weren't, you couldn't play Hero Clicks with them. And you had the two ships up in space. So you had your ship and you had the Klingon Bird of Prey coming in. Meanwhile, you're on the planet trying to solve a bunch of problems. And it was really well done, and I strongly recommend it. The problem is the next time you play, it will be the same. It'll randomize where things are, but that's it. And you're playing the same storyline over and over. And yeah, there's a couple branching paths, but they don't go enough different ways. Really good game to pull out now and then. Yeah, I'm, I'm, as much as I am not a Star Trek or really Star Wars fan, um, I enjoy them as, as what they are but I've always tended to be a hard science fiction. Yes. Uh, whereas Star Wars and Star Trek are soft science fiction. I mean, arguably Star Wars, Star Wars, Star Wars is isn't science fiction at all. Yeah. And <laughs> debated uh, yes. in, depending on your, on how you want to argue it. But I just came across this Star Trek frontiers, uh, specifically Star Trek, I have it. specifically Star Trek frontiers with the return of Khan expansion. Oh, I don't have that. Um, which, uh, Brings it up to a 4.69 weight. <laughs> okay, so so Star Trek Frontiers, I think, is a better Star Trek in a box than Ascendancy, but it's overly complicated, overly difficult, and the component quality is garbage. Like, it's so bad that it's annoying to play. The cards are so flimsy. You just, you're playing it going, someone update this game, someone print a new version. I'm sorry for hacking the publisher on this one. <laughs> well, it's just Star Trek Frontiers, just tonight, right? I, yeah, it's WizKids. Yeah. It, it's WizKids somehow has this license. So Danielle called out five year mission. That is the dice one. I did not enjoy that one at all. I, I owned it and sold it. It was called five year mission. And the whole point was that the old crew can run into the new crew and you can play them both. But it was just a bad Yahtzee ripoff where you're, you're trying to roll the set patterns on dice to complete missions. It didn't feel like Star Trek at all. Now, I am going to call out one that's now out of print, but everyone used to talk about is the Star Trek deck building game which was generally one of the worst Star Trek or one of the worst deck builders I ever played. And it was just whoever got the best ship first won the game. But then they put out two expansions. So there was the original 
Uh, it was the next gen, and then there was the the original series, which was better because the ships were better balanced. Then they did a next gen second chance or something, but then they did one with the Borg, and the Borg had a way to play co op, and that was amazing. And it felt like Star Trek, and you were building a crew, and you were trading technology, and you were using your skills, and the whole thing was you were being assimilated, and those were the bad cards in your deck. And if you ever drew an entire hand of five assimilation cards, you were out of the game. You were assimilated. So it was all about mitigating that. That was fantastic. But the other versions were terrible. Yeah, it's a uh, five-year mission's got a 6-5, which for a Star Trek game is pretty low. Oh, it's it's <laughs> like it's bad. You got to be a real fan. I think it's Nitzia. Or no, it's not. It's David E. Witcher. Yeah. So I had to look that up. Mayfair. But it's a Mayfair. So that, that it's, also... It's a Mayfair Euro... No, it was funny because I'm like, oh, I'm going to throw this in. I won't have much to say. And I'm like, wait, I own a lot more Star <laughs> Trek games than I'm thinking I own. And then, oh, final shout out because Deanna's favorite game, the original Star Trek, the trading card game from Decipher. That is the game Deanna collected over Magic. She loved it. We had a ton of fun with that game. It was that, neat. It was I may have actually that. played you like board one we of your decks that one. or your dad's decks or something and, and yeah. then played that. I never collected yeah. it, but I, I think I, do, I did play that one. That was very thematic. Your deck, and, and again, it was you had two lines of planets. You were doing your own thing while still kind of interacting with the other player. All right. So, uh, all right. So, there we got a nice SEO happy Star Trek game convert. That could have been a full episode. I had no <laughs> clue that could have been a full episode. That could have been a full episode. So starting off, our, our first question of the night from the chat room came from Euro Gamer Girl, who asked, what's a game you've played this year that you want to play more of? Oh, um, <laughs> pretty close. Um, right now, that would be all the bus. Um, we're going to be talking about that more when we get into the week in review. First experience with all the bus, I dug it. Everyone else hated it. Second experience <laughs> Again, with all the bus. I didn't hate it. I, I don't know. First experience, you weren't there. It was with Tori and Kat. Okay. Remember? Tori, Tori was like, I hate this game. Oh, no. I, I played Oh, you were there. Yeah, for I that. was there. Yeah, no, yeah. Tori hated it. Tori I hated it. I was I was in the air because there were a bu- there was a bunch of extreme going on. And yeah. it, it was you didn't have an opinion on the first. Yeah, game. it wasn't great, but it was but it could have been us. Right. Yes. It was one of those things. We we made enough. And Tori hated <laughs> uh, like, really, I, I have not had him have that negative reaction to a game in a long time. Um, So then we played the second game. Oh, and, and, and Deanna hated it. Deanna's like, I, you know, I'm, I, I hate that we have to review this because it means I have to play it three more times. And Sean loved it until we got to final scoring. Yeah, until, until it was determined that, oh, look, there is this huge runaway issue that we didn't catch. And is it a runaway issue because we missed it? Or is it a huge flaw in the game? Yeah. Which I, uh, spoiler for later, so far it hasn't happened again. So yeah. far it hasn't happened at all. And we had a game where I totally went for that. And I had 10 banked and she had three, but she still won. Okay. But there was more mitigation. There was, oh, I know you have the ability to bank three coins, so I'm going to make sure you never have three coins to bank. And that's what I thought was going to happen. And I've got to say the biggest thing with that game is Deanna has completely (laughs) flip-flopped. After three games playing two players, she's like, no, I like this one. This is a good game. Yeah, I I think it's, I I thought it had possibility, but there was a potentially glaring issue that concerned yeah. me after our second play. which so far I, again I, we haven't played enough we, we didn't play all that much this weekend there was one night at one particular place we played a bunch of games in a row and and i still there's some dumb things in there though like the the, the why the upgraded components don't make sense yeah <laughs> um the vault thing is just awkward I, I the fact i stole a component from another game to make this work better there's issues but i want to play more all the best because i want to Deep dive. We haven't touched any of the new new cards or anything like that. But that's more of a like new game of mine. I'm hyped about still more so than you know game I tried for the first time this year that I want to play more of. Um, Dune Imperium. Yes, Dune Imperium. We still haven't reviewed because I think I've only played it three times. Like I haven't even hit my usual. We have and to I think two of those were with review. me. So <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm at like maybe four plays, two to three plays. And technically, there's a play. I, I we're probably at four. Counting the two-player game Deanna and I played that we really didn't enjoy, and yeah, I have no sign, interest sign in me up again. <laughs> sign me up. Yeah. Love that game. So yeah, I want to play more Dune Imperium. Um, that's a big one. Uh, Scythe. I I'm worried Scythe is going to disappear. It's like we reviewed it now, right? The obligation's done, and I'm worried it's going to go on the shelf. I will admit this weekend we were really tempted to pick up an expansion. So one of the expansions that exists 
called Scythe Encounters. And all it is is more of the encounter deck, the deck where you go there and interesting things happen. You get interesting choices. It's just a bunch of those. So it would have been really easy to throw in um, because I'm sure Sean's not aware. Essex actually has a really solid board game store now. Bike store. (laughs) Yeah, both. It's both. Yeah, I I was surprised by that. Like we had we were literally at Schinkel's Market and came out and went, what's that? (laughs) And we walked across the street. Bikes and board games. Yes. So that's a big one. Um, other ones we played this year. I'd like to hear Deanna's answer on this too. You're welcome to to jump in and chat. Uh, some mention something in chat. What about you, Sean? Besides doing it, uh, anachrony is another one. Um, you know, I fin- oh, we fi- yeah. finally that's got that. That's not new to me this year, but no, yeah. it's not. But it, but it's new to me this year, and that's and that's yeah. definitely something uh, on the on the list. Um, I need to play anachrony more and actually use expansion content. Well, yeah, exactly. I mean, we I have we, this giant box from massive box, and we we just dabbled with the basic content. Uh, and there's all these other phrases and things that we never even touched. Uh, and yeah. there's so much. There is a ton. There was stuff when we were repacking it into the Kickstarter box that was still in shrink. <laughs> and I'm like, do I take it out? I'm like, I guess I take it out because it'll fit better. Yeah. A Euro Gamer Girl is saying that Dune Imperium is better with the expansion. And I've heard that. And the second expansion is going to fix a couple more things. And I, to be fair, we just haven't played it enough yeah, to find I, I things wouldn't. needing fixing. <laughs> um, I, I want the expansions because I want more content and I want some of the the other, um, you know, groups uh, that are coming from them. But as it's far as expansions, goes, X and X is just the coolest thing in Dune, in my opinion. That That is the part of the... The Butlerian Jihad and X were the two parts that I wanted expanded on. Except then, dude, son expanded on the Butlerian Jihad, and it was kind of like the Clone Wars and Star Wars. And I was like, "What? What's happening? Why?" Oh yeah. So and, and yeah, we we agree with that. Uh, the two player experience yes. wasn't great. No, <laughs> no, 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 not at all. We did not enjoy yep. that. Yeah. So absolutely, two player for Dune Imperium was not was no. not ideal. <laughs> I, I will not do that again unless the expansion changes it some way. And that's one of those I'm like, oh, you almost shouldn't have put that on the box. <laughs> uh, so Deanna saying Arnak, assuming it was new to her this year. See, Arnak, I'm getting my fix by playing on Board Game Arena. I'm, I'm not having a big urge to take out the physical game and get it down and get it played because we play often enough on Board Game Arena. Right. Oh, there you go. The expansion's fixed two player. So that, that's go. intriguing. Uh, what else have I played? You know what? Here, I, I again an ama so i haven't done research let me very quickly bring up my board game geek what i played this year and see if i can find any more you got other ones aren't i or uh, not, aren't I? yeah what else got? Uh, yeah it's a, i can see all of a sudden dune imperium immortality now the community is saying best two to four. Oh wow okay so that's a big Whoa. change i guess there was a big announcement today Disney's getting into the CCG collectible card game market, eh? Oh, I didn't even see that. Disney Lorcana trading card game. Oh, or maybe I saw there, something about hot, it, but I didn't know. New announcement. Yeah. I, I, we barely have been online, <laughs> honestly. Like I've tried to avoid being online. Right. Um, buy a game, date range. Honestly, I, I know it's not a great game, but, uh, you know, as a, as a way to get your daughters to the table more, I would be happy to play a couple more games of Villainous, which oh, is new okay. to me this year. My, my daughter will happily do <laughs> Exactly. That. I know your daughter loves it. Um, I don't know. It, I, I, I only had the one experience well with it, so I don't know. Uh, I, I, need to, I, I would need to try more. Um, oh, here's a good example of one. Charterstone, because we can't. Like, we finished it. It's done. And I don't want to play now that it's done. I would love to play more Charterstone. Yes, we bought the campaign thing. Uh, the thing is, I want to play it with the same group, and that group is currently working through a different campaign game. Uh, Terror Below is another one I would love to give another try. I don't think okay. our first experience was the best experience for uh, that game. It was too late at night. I think it, it could have been a much better game than it turned out being. I agree. Uh, point Solid, I'd say, but I'm playing tons of it. Like, we played a lot on the weekend. Uh, no, 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 no. Chiseled, we're, we've been enjoying. Mm-hmm, yeah. I would I would happily play more chiseled. No, no, no. It's interesting. No. I Dune Imperium is rated as a weight three, and it doesn't feel that heavy to me. Yeah, maybe that's me. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I I I, I unless I'm, I'm missing something about the game. 
I, I, uh, I Ex Libris. I am really enjoying Ex Libris. I want to play more Ex Libris because I want to see more combos. Mm. Bell Smashers. Eh. I still have to try though. <laughs> it's neat. Yeah. But it's too long. That's what where it, it, it feels like it should be a filler game and it's not. Right. Spelling games to me should be shorter. I, I don't know if it's too much brain, too much thinking. Underwater Cities. I have not played enough of that game. Yeah, no, I could go for another game. I, I not, I, it was I, not I really, as fantastic as I thought some people made it out to be, but it was good. And I could definitely, you know, again, mm -hmm. I, I never felt I never felt the same way about Terraforming Mars either. I know right. you're the hugest fans and I enjoy Terraforming Mars, uh, but I never fell in love with it. And and I, I feel like my first experience, at least with Underwater Cities, was very much the same. It's like, this is a good, solid game, but it hasn't hooked me and you know it hasn't gotten yeah. me to that oh i gotta play this all the time but yeah I definitely and i gotta admit that's kind of what happened to me underwater cities always feels like i haven't figured it out yet like i haven't reached that level where i can plan ahead know what i'm gonna do like i don't oh, i don't sit down to play that game underwater cities is on bga is it oh we need oh. to be doing that <laughs> there you go no under like like terraforming mars i'll get my starter hand and i'll plan out a whole strategy and then i'll see the cards that come out and i'll adapt and I feel I need to get to that point in Underwater Cities. Whereas Underwater Cities, I like, I, I sit there and I'm like, I don't know what to do. I got these cards. I guess I get the most stuff if I take that red action with this red card. Right. And then eventually maybe I start getting a combo going and I try to turn that into points. I just, I still feel like I'm floundering in that game. Right. Uh, you should play more Alien Frontiers. Yep. Because that game's fantastic. uh that That's might be weird. underwater I, cities isn't coming up on bga hero quest i should play more because i we spent a lot of money on it. Uh, those are the big ones like looking through what i played this year so those those are those are the biggest uh if there are fans of uh um king of tokyo uh bga did release king of tokyo power up today oh that's the first expansion to me that that's a required expansion for for so for, it took uh, them a year they are now they're now it's been now been out for a year but they've uh they've added king of tokyo power up yeah i to me that, that that's a must-have expansion that is most definitely a must-have expansion yeah i was uh, I, the underwater okay. cities may be on yukata or something like that be. oh yeah. beyond the sun's on there i really want to try beyond the sun but I think that seemed like a game I want to play in person. Yeah, first. it's another one of those. You know, let's let's not learn that online, maybe. Um, I thought I did finally lose a uh, a Tigris and Euphrates. Oh, there you uh, go. Game. So maybe I would do have to learn it now. But <laughs> we'll see. They finally figured out. Everyone else finally figured out what they were doing and went. Oh wait, we let him do that. What? <laughs> wait, why are we letting him get away with that? Uh, All right, I think that's probably pretty good. For games Alrighty. we want to play more of. All right, now here's and here's one from Ron Talks Tabletop. Thank you again, Ron, for uh, resubscribing today. Yes. Question: What board games do you feel that best scratch your own RPG itch? None. Board games don't scratch the RPG <laughs> itch. <laughs> uh, that's the simple answer. To I, some I agree. Will... I I would say I I could see if if I was able to get myself into an active in-person blood bowl league that would touch it. That would, that would at least start heading in the right direction for me. Yeah. But, but generally, no, I agree. There, there really aren't games that, that do the same thing. Uh, I, <laughs> I guess the only, the only difference would be crossover games. Like if you consider for the queen, a board game or a card game, then that 100% that, right. Cause that game totally scratches an RPG, which I love. But to me, it's an RPG. Sure. And like to me, that's not it. But I can see people calling it a board game or a card game because you don't make a character, you don't have character sheets, there's no campaign. Like that totally depends on your definition of a role playing game. So I guess my answer would be for the queen. Sure. Um, I will say for the, the Tales of the Loop, when I play that game, especially with Tori and Kat and Deanna, we got into character, and we had a lot of fun making up stories or what was actually happening, right? Like the, the whole, this person uh, earlier in the game tried to help another kid go to over a chain link fence and failed and the kid got injured. Do three rounds later doing something completely different 
and this character is not allowed to help because of this whatever uh, cubes in this place and then the person playing them going there's no way i'm doing that Do you remember what happened at the fence like that part of that game was amazing unfortunately game... <laughs> unfortunately i feel like because you were right absolutely i mean that definitely happened i was there at the table it happened but i feel like Part of why that happens is because you're responding to the fact that it's a crappy game and you need <laughs> to make it more enjoyable. So That's... why not our role play along with it? Uh, anything to make your, 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 you know, make the table Find feel the more enjoyable. Uh, there's nothing wrong. And there's nothing wrong with making your own fun, but it yeah. does not make it a good board game. I still say it's better at three. It's it's playable at three. I haven't gotten rid of it yet, but that's probably because I got rid of a huge pile of stuff. <laughs> All uh, right, uh, yeah. we'll keep up on this one because I'm, I'm going to keep talking about it. But in the meantime, chat room, we could use some more questions. Uh, there was a, a you know what? Up, we could I have to say, more. I remember, do you want to call Dark Future a board game? Because yeah, we got into a hundred percent yeah, board game. We we got it. There was some there was some role playing in that, and there's I, yeah. I feel like that that definitely well, well there was the role it. playing in that you're leveling up your your driver, yeah. which was just a number. You're leveling up your car. It's 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 a much a role playing game as BattleTech is. Yep. Yeah. Right, you're getting your money from your matches, but that was all using the campaign rules. Using the campaign rules from uh, White Line Fever did that. I'm um, trying to think of others. Um, Star Wars Imperial Assault, to an extent. Now, I only played as the Empire, but I very much at the feel that I was, you know, Vader sitting on Mustafar planning things, or I was Count Dooku, or I, I was I, not the Emperor, but I was some form of person coordinating things so that bad things would happen to the characters because you literally like stack the deck at the beginning of the game you look through you you get these sets of operation cards and you're like i'm going to use this one which is all about my stormtroopers will be tougher or i'm going to use this one that means there'll be more traps on the map and you kind of pick from them and you make a deck and that's the stuff that will come out now with that that's a, the part of that game was all the expansions would give you more so like if you picked up like the general veers expansion which I've never understood why he's such a big character in Star Trek. He's like the general who's on one of the ad ads at the beginning of, of I'm like, most people don't even know his name, but for some reason fans really like general Veers, And I don't know why I think he talked back to Vader and didn't die or something. But anyway, you get the general Veers expansion. And while it comes with rules to play him as skirmish and it gives him a card that you can buy him during the game, but it gives you a whole new one of these plots that you can use. And I'm probably using the wrong names because I haven't played Imperial Assault in more than five years, like the operations, plots, whatever they're called. But I think the players very much felt like they were playing characters, like like with the leveling up and and like decisions were made in that that I think were suboptimal because some things were cooler. And to me, that's where the RPG breaks in, right. where where if you don't get that point where you're like, no, I'm keeping this cloak because it looks cooler, then you've reached RPG realm. Whereas you're like, no, I'm taking this because it's plus two, <laughs> you know, even though my character would probably never use it, but I don't care. It's plus two. And I think that's the, that's the gap that got bridged, at least with my group. Here's an interesting one. I just discovered Gaslands has a legacy system. Okay. And I could totally picture us in the past. I don't think anymore, but when we were, when we were younger, I could totally have seen us doing legacy Gaslands and essentially play, doing our, an RPG out of it. Uh, right. I, I, sec, I still, my, my, they're my sons now, but I have the 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 Hot Wheels collection that could have uh, done quite a bit. I, I, Gloomhaven did a bit of it. We definitely did some role playing, but we all we always played optimally. Right. That was very much you had to. Gloomhaven is hard. Do not feel bad about playing on an easier difficulty if you were playing <laughs> Gloomhaven. But there was definitely character moments, especially when you would get a choice. Our group would get into character whenever we had to. You know, you're at the end and this happens and someone drops this thing. What do you do? I, I Whatever they were called. There was the Gloomhaven cards and then the road cards, I think they were called, or the city cards and the road yeah, cards. Yeah, city cards and road cards. Yeah, we used to get in character for those. And while there was smack talk and stuff while we were playing, that was definitely in character. And while the, there, there's slight spoiler, Gloomhaven's been out long enough. There's a thing really early in the game where you go and murder a, a bunch of the PCs race and I was just like, whoa, OK, we are not the heroes. This is not what I expected from this game. And while one of the players was playing the race that we just basically went and genocided. And I'm like, wow, dude, are you OK with this? And he's like, well, I guess I have to be because the game made me do it. But there were some definitely some stuff like that. 
So, so I would I would put Gloomhaven in there. So I, still, it, none of it scratches the RPG edge. No, I, I agree. There, they, there, there's if anything, it actually makes the itch worse. It's that it's yeah. that you can just almost get to it, and now you re- now it really itches because you're thinking about it. Yeah, and I'll admit we were playing Star Wars Imperial Assault, and one of my players, Mike Murphy, was like, "So when can we play Edge of the Empire?" <laughs> like like when can we stop playing the stupid board game and like let, let, let me play my character yeah. he's like i'll make this dude and i'll make this character i'm sure i can do it and i'll play him so that you know when the stupid thing happens in the board game because it's a board game he can go no screw that i pick up the crate and throw it at the droid oh no the crates are a blocking terrain you can't actually pick it up there all right so we got a couple more questions from the uh, chat room they're on a roll tonight uh darkling blank light asks us do you think too much theme can hurt a game's gameplay or appeal. Definitely. I'm trying to think of an example though. That that that's a question that could have used some research on. I uh, think me, it can happen. To me, it's a balance. It's a balance issue, right? It's it's too much theme and not enough gameplay to balance out that theme. Uh, you can be dripping in all the theme in the world, but if it's a cruddy game, it's still a cruddy. It's still a cruddy game, and yeah. I think there are certain designers. Uh, out there who have fallen into a trap of that you know it, it's piling on their theme and trying to get the player to be immersed and in the process forgetting about you know the fact that it's a game and it needs mechanics to work i I would think tales from the loop is an example of this yep because the theme was there but it hurt the mechanics and it made the game too difficult like the the, the cooperation rule that you can combine two different pieces of technology to automatically succeed at something. But then the mechanics weren't there to like, it came up so infrequently. Yeah. And then the whole, once your kid gets scared, you can't ask for help. And I'm like, I get it. You're now scared and you're, you're, you're focused inwards and you're no longer can contribute to the rest of the group. But the dice mechanics and that were so terrible with a 25% success rate, you needed that help. Yeah, they, yes, they took this thematically why. Yeah, they, they took this massive theme that they had from their RPG world, which is fantastic. We, we are all fans oh, yeah, of The Loop. Fans Tales from the, the Loop is amazing. Theme. But when you try to cram that into the board game, again, it just collapses in on itself yeah. and the experience doesn't work the way they i think wanted it to and that's a shame because again we do love the theme mm-hmm. and it kind of broke the game i think if you detract if you'd taken a little bit of that theme away and and helped focus the mechanics on the game and then you know dusted the theme over top of it it probably would have made a better game yes. than uh than what they got which yeah, is like unfortunate. in that game like one of the the house rules that's just great is whenever you take damage Put the cube where you want. And even just doing that makes it mechanically better. Because even, even there were just so many little things in that. The hacking, yep. the entire hacking system. I'm like, you're trying to make this this awesome, epic, thematic battle, and it's just frustrating. Yeah. And uh, Eurogamer Euro Euro has a great point in the chat room. Too much theme in rule books can make it hard to learn. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, and this goes back to a great Twitter post that we talked about, I think, on Sunday. Uh, where there were certain designers going on and talking about how long your rule book should be. And, you know, eight pages, single spaced with lots of big pictures is about the limit uh, for a, you know, easy to learn, board, you know, a, a, a for accessible, appeals to the mass yeah, market, an accessible board game. Uh, and as soon as you start draping all this theme and background in, especially in amongst the rules, yeah, it becomes problematic. If you want to add in a, a thematic rule book, or, you know, you teach the game and then you've got pages of, at the end or you've got a couple of pages at the beginning that set up the theme for you before you teach the game. That's one thing. But it's when you start mixing and mingling the theme. Mm-hmm. And I think the Ghost Twix has made some of that mistake. Uh, and that's part of why the, the, the three rule books and, and confusions mm-hmm. and things have happened. If one of those rule books was just the story yes. and and the other books were how to play the game oh, the absolute worst was there was a book that was supposed to be how to learn the game but all it did was reference the other two books yeah that was actually terrible that was actually a horrible one i'm trying to think of other example i like it's definitely a thing 
Like yep. whenever you get a thing and you're like, well, that's dumb. And they're like, oh, but it fits the theme. Like I know that happens. I'm just not thinking of any actual examples in front of me right now. Um, what I will say is that I love when the theme matches the mechanics. Like that's different. Absolutely. But there are definitely examples. Aqualin. Like Aqualin, there's a perfect example. That should have been abstract shapes. Because it, it, why are groups of the same color different fish gathering? Why, why? Why is this turtle hanging out with this fish, hanging out with this octopus, and that's worth points? And I'm like, at least the fish school? But, like, turtles might gather together? But, like, it, it just made no sense. And I'm like, why does this even have an underwater theme? They liked their artwork, I guess. It just didn't make any sense whatsoever why this game had this theme. And I'm like, if, if it was one part, yes, you want to group the same type of animal together. Okay. But then why do you want to group the same color of animal? That, that it, it totally felt, once you got to that point, you're like, oh, you know, this theme doesn't actually work. Just give me a bunch of diamond squares, circles, stars, pluses. Give me the lucky charms shapes and the different colors. And the game would have been better, in my opinion, because instead it's ambiguous and some of the shapes are similar to each other. And it's really easy to forget what you're trying to group and gather or pay attention to what your opponent's grouping and gather. And I mean, I, you know, I've said this a number of times in the show. I've been on record water deep, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, to me, it's, a yeah, but I don't think the theme gets in the way. It doesn't get in the way, but again, it's, it's, it's meaningless. It, it doesn't to me, the game it's, it's excess. Um, you, you, you can keep the cards clearer if you didn't have to cram all the D and D stuff on there. Uh, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's, uh it's just unnecessary and that's where it doesn't meld well whereas i think something like quacks of quedlinburg it's not a heavy theme it's not an in your face oh. theme but it actually works it yeah. actually makes a whole lot of sense what's going on in that oh, game what i love about that one is what i love when the theme of a game helps me teach it where it's just logical why this would happen and I can teach quacks in a way that it makes sense, even though I'm not quite sure why rat tails would thicken your pot. But like, and it can explain it in a way that it all makes sense. You're like, look, you're in a fair. You're trying to get people's attention. So you want your pot to bubble. When you put these in, these snap bangs in, it causes your pot to bubble. But you put too many in and it explodes. So you want a really excited pot. And you want to put in more ingredients. So you don't want to put in one. You want to put twos or fours in because they take up more space, which means they move further. And I can like just totally explain it. And then I'm like, okay, now after the first round's done, you notice this guy's way ahead. Everyone's paying attention to their pot. What can you do to try to get people's attention? Well, you start sneaking in rat tails. But the problem is, is people are still paying attention to seconds. So they don't get as many rat tails. First and last, no one's paying attention. They get to throw a bunch of rat tails in. What's it do? It thickens your pot. And like by describing it that way, people are just, yeah, yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That yeah. makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah, whenever you can use the theme to teach the mechanic or uh, or use the mechanics to explain the theme, it's a great balance. Um, and, and that's uh, sadly lacking in a lot of games these days. But when it does hit that sweet spot, really mm -hmm. makes for a, a more enjoyable game that people are just willing to play more because it's easier to grasp, all right? There's, you don't have as much of a teach um or even if you even if it is a harder game even if it's a heavier game it it clicks in faster right yes. i mean you know maybe it's one of those games where you want to play a play around and then restart afterwards but when you play yeah. that round you're like oh well when i spin the pulsar this does this and that yeah. oh of course there we go perfect let's get this let's play one of the best examples of that is veen host deluxe i remember teaching jeff and sheila seuss now jeff and sheila seuss are gamers but Sheila's not really familiar with heavy games and Jeff's into eclectic weird games. He's not, he's not a, he's not, not like a, a party gamer, but he's also never played a Vital Lacerda game, right? And I sit down and I teach them this game and I'm like, look, these are the different wine regions of Portugal. And of course, each wine is going to have distinct flavors and they're known for different things. And this region, their wine's not as good, but they developed a cellaring system that makes the wine better. And I can teach that game and absolutely every action you can take in the game makes perfect sense thematically. It's I'm going to go here to do this thing to collect this because I would do that to make my grapes worth more. Or no, I have really weak grapes, but if I hire a bunch of tasting houses, I can make up for it for the money. And similarly, wine's just a good theme for board games. Bean hosts, 
which is 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 in my opinion, it's Vital Lacerda's um being host luck, sorry, Viticulture. Viticulture is the zoomed in. You're just playing one region. Um, not that the games are literally related. But that game just makes sense because you're like, I need to send a worker to the mash ton to be able to mash my grapes. And when I do that, I now get low quality grapes. Well, every turn I leave that counter there, they age and get better. But at some point, I'm going to have to sell some of my wine to get enough money to be able to buy more fields to get more grapes. So how late do you and that's a big thing in Venos is how long can you wait to sell your grapes? And and it just makes sense because you're looking at grapes and you're looking at this and getting a seller does this and hiring more migrant workers lets you harvest more grapes. And like it's it's another one where I find the theme is really well tied in that makes it easier to explain. But like Venos Deluxe is probably one of the heavier games I own. Yeah, and it v- makes perfect sense. Yeah, Venos Deluxe is a 4.0. And that's yeah, not and, a game that I would introduce to people like Jeff and Sheila initially right. for the most part. Off because, the bat, right? yeah, I mean, because that's a, a meaty game with a lot of decision points. Yes. But and, 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 as, as, as your gamer girl says, you know, when it makes sense thematically, it reinforces the gameplay. Yes. Plus, people remember things that make sense. Like it ties to real life. It ties into their personal experiences, ties into what you know about wine. Everyone knows wine gets better with age. If there's a mechanic and you go, well, the wine ages, you're like, well, of course the wine ages. Everyone knows wine ages. Oh, if I sell cheese at my winery, more people will come. Well, yes, because people sell cheese at wineries. If it was like, if I sell spinach at my winery, more people will come. You're like, well, what? What? Spinach? Really? Right. Uh, Yeah. Uh, technically i think we've already answered the next question in a way <laughs> yeah i, I think we, so. we kind of we kind of moved in without me actually trying to do that so Eurogamer girl had actually asked what's your favorite theme and mechanic combo uh where where if a game has both you'll always be interested in it um well okay that's the the, the first part of the question uh Vien host deluxe Vien host deluxe does it the best and like i said i love teaching that game Plax is another one where I love teaching the game because it just makes sense. Um, Pulsar 2845 tends to be pretty good. But you need someone with the right mindset. I'm um, trying to think of others. Like Azul does not. I right. can't teach Azul quickly. I, I can mechanically tell you how it works. Well, one of the, one of the things so I find, so. um, and, and this isn't really a theme or mechanic as it sort of falls under mechanic, is that is the iconography. Uh, it that is actually one of the things that makes a huge difference to me now. Uh, and the more I play games with great iconography, the more, even if it's not going to be a heavy sci-fi game, I may be interested in playing mm-hmm. it because it leaves a better experience yep. for the play. Because again, it just makes sense. Uh, and and Anachrony was one of them. Anachrony has some a crazy amount of iconography. And when you first look at mm-hmm. it, you go, oh my God, what is this? But by the time you're done your first turn, every single yes. icon out there makes sense, including the ones that you don't see until the fourth round. Um, and that's another game that honestly, I can teach better because of the theme. Yep. Except for the stupid part where I have to front load everything beside before you decide what card to choose. Yes. But once you get into explaining, look, you have these many people and to go outside, they have to go in a, a suit. And these are the spots the suits can reach. And this big square means lots of people can go there because there's lots of people will trade with the merchants, but there's only actually three people to hire. So you can only go here, but you can also go visit the city council by going up here and take an action that's already taken. And I can show you and, and the whole thing about the wake up your people or give them water is it, thematic and it ties in and I can teach people that and it sinks in. It makes sense. It's like you have two ways to get all your workers back. You can wake them all up and just tell them to get to work or you can slowly wake them up and give them breakfast and yeah, get yeah, them give them breakfast or blow the air horn <laughs> or blow, yeah basically <laughs> right like like we always call it clapping because the one symbol looks like clapping it's like yeah. get up wake up i'm not gonna actually do it because the mic will pick up too much that game's great for explaining in most ways there yeah. there are aspects of anachrony and honestly even the time travel in that's easy to explain yeah because i usually wait till the first turn and go okay is there something you want to buy but you can't afford it do you feel like you can't put enough mechs out on the field? Are you short workers? Well, all you got to do is send yourself stuff from the future and here's how you do it. Yeah. No, it really does. Uh, it, it really does make things so much easier when you've got that iconography. And I mean, um, Arnak is another one too. It's, it's, there isn't as much iconography in it, 
But what's there just makes a lot of sense. Are you walking, boating, bit, yes. or flying? You know, these are the different the the the, the, the different types it's of resources. The upgrades. the upgrades take a bit. What yeah. what do all those different upgrade symbols mean? Mainly the stuff that's on the the exploration track. But you know, I, but even that, I mean, again, it's once you see, it, it's like, oh, that means okay, that's what they're doing. Fine, they're going to use that symbol for to yep. mean turning or whatever. Sure, upgrading, great. Uh, and it, again, it flows really quickly. And again, they've also on top of the iconography use the materials of the yes. pieces that, to that's be different. the new next step thing I'm yeah, that's, loving. that's your that's your other uh your other level where where you can really kind of like oh the difference between plastic and cardboard is a game difference yeah makes sense side yep. did that right Sides, yep. you got your wooden pieces and your plastic pieces plastic pieces can fight each other wooden pieces can't yep. that's that's the biggest distinction between those Size is another one that once you know it, you can teach it better based on the theme, but it's still pretty rough. <laughs> yeah, I, I've I've yet to learn. How I, 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 and I what I still haven't done is I, I did go back and I played the digital version of Scythe and I and I enjoyed it more than I did. What I need to do is I need to go back into Scythe, reset all my progress and do the tutorial oh, again to see okay. if having played the game and knowing it now mm. the tutorial makes any sense or if it's still utter gibberish to me because that <laughs> was the problem with the side digital i went through the tutorial and i had no yeah. clue it meant nothing to me yeah so. we may we may just talk about icons this one we were yet to shout out the you know tool i realize it's not fair to the rest of the graphic designers <laughs> out there but i'd be happy if you know tool just designed graphically every game ever made I, yeah. i'd be totally cool with that Oh yeah, but he he didn't. Design, who did anachrony? Because again, I was wondering that. I, I I was thinking about looking it up, but I didn't. He did not do anachrony. No. So anach so, yeah, anachrony was designed. Uh, well, there's a bunch of artists on this. Yeah, but is there any graphic designers listed? Yeah. Did that someone? Because that's one of the new fields on Board Game Geek that wasn't always filled out. No, this one doesn't. Yeah, so it could have been any of the artists. Or yeah, there's else. five different artists on there, and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce their names. Uh, there are far Fair too enough. many um, Eastern European accents and uh, flourishes above those letters for me to have any faith in getting it correct at all. Yeah. All right. So favorite theme and mechanic combo. So this isn't necessarily like they go well together, but the two together, if it's a deck building and uh, superheroes, what 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 is it like? I'll pick up every superhero deck builder. I was thinking for you, that's what I'd think for favorite theme and mechanic combo. Uh, I mean, I, yes, but again, I haven't. You know, I didn't go down the road. Of That's legendary. true. You never even tried Marvel. I don't um, I, I have it sealed in plastic. Um, oh, okay. It, it never got opened for various reasons. But uh, uh, actually, is it legendary? It's one of maybe it's legendary. I don't know. One of the Marvel deck, Mar a Marvel deck builder. I guess it must be legendary. I think that's the only one. Um, that that I got on a deal from 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 tabletop deals. Um. But uh, no, again, I like superhero RPGs. The board games, not so much for me. Yeah. Um, deck builders are definitely uh, a thing. Where so I think if you pro probably sci -fi deck if builders. you can get me like hard sci-fi deck builders, I don't think there is such a thing. Um, I don't know how there would necessarily Horizons. Maybe that was a different kind of deck building though. Yeah. Yeah, I don't you know. Played Horizons, right? Yeah. No, I did. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. The best iconography we've seen in a game. We're pulling this right out of the chat right now from Pax. We're not going to finish mechanic and combo, theme and mechanic. Uh, I I can't uh, I can't think of anything that that sort of I always be interested in. Um, yeah, I, I I do not have a favorite theme. I have themes I don't like. I mean, hard sci-fi is my theme. Period. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely going to go. But when it comes, to, but but to to say there's a favorite mechanic that pairs along with that. I mean, I guess technically um dune could probably be due to period yeah. it's hard it's a hard sci-fi sci -fi deck builder um and i definitely did love it so possibly possibly yeah i don't have a favorite theme but there's themes i don't like i i don't care about zombies and i don't care about cthulhu cthulhu mythos i i played some games that are good i i'm i i don't know if i played a good zombie game i've played some cthulhu games that are good i'd like mansions of madness mm -hmm. um that's probably others I, well you know uh, cthulhu dead uh, death may die was a really yeah that fun was game that was well but i sold it compared to like, it, well the problem is it it had limited play and, and for the cost of it what yes. you got in a game versus well, you needed the full in kickstarter to get the full experience. that was a fomo problem 
That was a not even it's missed out. I missed out. I didn't get the whole thing. I just got this one box. No, but I, I think even it was incomplete. But even even if you'd gotten the whole box, you're still you're not going to play all the possible combinations. You just not. Right. It's not going to be the interesting that long there. You, you know, there was a ton of stuff there. You could have spent a fortune on it. And realistically, you're going to get through all the scenes once, mm. maybe twice. And it's never going to get played again, except maybe, you know, when you want to show it off. Yeah, um, so themes, yeah. I don't, I, I'm not Cthulhu, not zombies, um, not sports, not, not in like a blood bowl maybe, but that's more <laughs> fantasy favorite. Uh, that's possibly fantasy. Um, not farming. There's just too many farming games. <laughs> um, not cooking. I don't even call that like, like food. I'm just running through various themes in my head. I guess a fantasy possibly. Um, but I love Star like Star Wars. Like, give me a really good Star Wars. Give me a Star, well, Star Wars. Star Wars is fantasy. Builder. Let's be yeah, let's let's yeah. not let's not mince words here. Star Wars is a fantasy series, not a give me give series. me a good Star Wars deck builder. I might be interested. I, I don't love deck builders. I'm like my favorite mechanic is is the Shogun series of games, which I've now Sean's played two of you you tried all three, haven't you? I uh, Wallenstein, Shogun, and yeah. um and Immortals. Yeah, and never, I never love mentioned game. Immortals that, again. <laughs> yeah, I, I even like Immortals. Of the three, it's the worst. But oh, <laughs> I, I love the Cube Tower. But what I no program movement there, there, there is go. my favorite mechanic. There you go. Yep, because I also love, love, love Robo Rally. Robo you even love Jaws, and yeah, I was so over that planning. game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I like programming. That's true. Because I was thinking, I'm like, what is it in like? And I love the Cube Tower, but the Cube Tower is unrelated to that. I just I love the you have your hand of provinces in your hand. And you have eight different actions you can do, and you pick which action happens at which province. And only two of them are attacks, so it's not a big battle game. And it's all about trying to outwit your opponents and think of your opponents and where are they going to attack, where are they not. So I got to say that the the programmed movement in Shogun, Wallenstein, Immortals, and I want more, please, um, put out more games like that. Though I, I guess they're all already done, so... I don't know if that series is ever coming out with any more, but I love those games. And well, what are the themes there? You got Japanese feudal Japan, you got medieval Germany, and you got heaven versus earth. Uh, heaven versus earth. I, I wanted more. I wanted something different than what Bad. you got. It if was you... just two back and forth. It was, it was like everyone called it a knife fight in a phone booth, but I'm like, it's a night fight in a phone booth in a blizzard. Cause <laughs> like it just, it just, Yay, you killed all my troops, but then they come back and they kill all your troops. And then his troops come out of nowhere because they were off on the side of the board and he played the right card and it, it was too chaotic. Um, I, I prefer strategy games. Tactics is nice, but I like some strategy too. Yeah. So yeah, I really like that series. So yeah, mechanics and I love Robo Rally. Robo Rally, there's a game I should play again. It's probably been 10 years. Not the new version, the old classic Richard Garfield before he got famous making magic Robo Rally. Yes, I know. Don't put out 80 boards. Stick to one or two back and forth, a little zigzagging. I love that. See, and that's, and that's one thing I need to play. I have played the new version. I never yeah, played the, the new old versions. Version. Uh, I, someone brought the new version and we played it upstairs at, during, on, new Year, on one New Year's. Right. Uh, and I, but I've never actually played the old version. So. Um, oh, geez, Deanna mentioned there. Aventuria for games I want to play more of. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but have you even played that this year? I was kind of discounting that because I don't think you've, oh, you've actually played that this year. I might not even have played this year. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Euro Gamer Girl was saying fantasy deck building co op. Uh, and so that's where Aventuria came up is, why well, have you? It's, okay, but that's the deck building, that's deck construction, where deck you're construction, building your deck, deck before building. you play. You're not improving a deck or during play. See, I, I, to be honest, I do miss some deck construction. The problem is most deck construction turns out to be magic, which is just a money pit, which yes. I have no interest in ever getting into again. Well, I, I, Venturia is one of those. If I played it enough, I might get into it. We've only ever played with just set decks. But even with set decks, there is the thing where you get treasure at the end. Right. And you always have a 30 card deck. So when you add in your treasure, you have to take something out. So there's that aspect. But yeah, it's totally deck construction. It's sit down before you play, sit and play, build your deck and then play it. Yeah, no, and uh, what I miss, I, and again, it wasn't a great game, but I enjoyed it, was um, Vampire, the card game, like the, 
the old vampire deck building that's game back. that we had. Uh, that's, that's that was back a, in a way. It it wasn't a great game, but there was something about that particular deck construction game that was hitting hitting a mark for me the even big more thing than with that. that one was multiple players it wasn't a one versus two it was right. political it was you wanted three to five to i think you could play like eight players Something like together that, yeah. playing that one it was ridiculous and there was voting and there was some neat stuff i made an unbeatable deck in it that seemed broken that was well yeah yeah I again it. it wasn't a great game but there was something about some of the mechanics and the way that yeah. game played and, and it wasn't as much of a you know you need to have the rare card that you have to maybe get uh, yeah. It was easy enough at the time to get all the card, more or less all the cards, and just build whatever deck you, you wanted. Yeah, um, and that was that was another enjoyable part. You know, if you can get the set of cards and just choose from, you know, way more cards than you can, you're allowed in a deck to build that one small deck. But everyone has the same cards to choose from. Uh, then it's fun. All right, I think we'll do one more. I don't know what time we actually got it started, but it's almost ten thirty. So. Yeah uh pax is asking what's the best iconography you've seen in a game and i'm running it through my head um i'm sure most of you know tool games but i'm I, like i'm I, I know there's a perfect example and i'm not well, a lot of people have, are, have definitely necessarily sort of called it out as the best but brought up race for the galaxy no that's not you're the best that's, that's one of the worst <laughs> the, the icons don't even make sense for what you're trying to do like they're not tied to the actions uh, race for the galaxy has brilliant iconography because once you learn it right you don't need the rule book everything's perfectly clear on the cards and you can look at it at a glance but, but learning, the learning it is curve not <laughs> is huge yeah and whereas, i do not think it's good whereas whereas a game like anachrony again it just anachrony really is pretty made good sense it's you know you, there. there were a couple of things you were like oh what is I, but as soon as you learned what a couple of the strange little things were I, it was great no, uh, uh, Vinhos Deluxe is up there. Um, Preda Portero was definitely not. That's an Eno tool design, I think. Uh, I just feel like there's a perfect answer here, and I'm forgetting it. Yeah, and I'm there trying was to think something. of... I remember something being out on the table and going, oh my gosh, the iconography on this game is perfect. I can clearly s sitting back what everything is and how clear it can be. Point salad. I don't know if that's I, really I can. I don't know if I call that iconography. It, it's it's literal representation. It's so like, yeah, they're icons, but they're not reminding you of actions or where to place. Them. Point salad does work really well. You do basically the, the rule book doesn't even have much on it. It is slick. Yeah. Which in in a might for laying out this game and going holy oh um Bastille from Queen Games. Bastille's iconography was fantastic once you knew how to play. They were huge. They were big. It was easy to see. Like, clearly showed you put two cubes back in a bag and pull cubes out and do this. I, I, of all games, like, that that was a hidden gem from us when we brought that back from Origins 2019. I think we brought that back. But yes, have, playing Bastille was just, like, beautiful iconography. Like, like just big, bold, clear... The board was numbered one through 10. It was really clear what order to do things. There was a track on the side that summarized how scoring worked that was there for the whole game. You knew when you got in the end, you were going to go through these steps and it showed you there was a clear break in the middle of that game where things changed. That was fantastic. But yeah, that's the game I was thinking of. I just like, I remember the first time I set it up and played it and taught it. And I was just like, wow, the iconography in this is fantastic. Like, it's one of those where if I had totally forgot how to teach someone if i forgot a section of the board someone would be like oh does this mean this and they get it right and right. that's where it was great uh one game that i see mentioned a lot and uh while mo doesn't tend to do online research i do uh mm -hmm. is yokohama yeah yokohama has, i've got that know, one it's a pretty good a lot of icons and uh generally pretty clear uh and oh, that, a lot of people are mentioning the gallerist lisboa as well yeah, I don't. Those are two different games. Uh, those are both Ian O'Toole or uh, Bayern Vitale Serta games, the Gallerist and Lisboa, right? Which I have not played either. I, and I see Terra Mystica mentioned here, but I don't know. I don't does I don't feel like that's no super awesome. <laughs> I, I I don't agree. It, it, if there if there was one. a better way to explain the point bowls, the power bowls, then maybe. Um, mm. like in I guess when you lift the things off, the symbols are pretty good. 
Uh, okay. One that's mentioned as just okay iconography is Great Western Trail. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, that fits. You know, just, that, just that's okay. one where I definitely have to reference the book. So Snail Runs is totally agreeing uh, on uh, Bastille. Literally said, you know, iconography was great. Someone who was playing for the first time with experienced players was fantastic. I didn't have to ask. I could just glance and get what I had to do. Right. Oh, that game was fantastic. Like The only hard part about it is teaching the cards, like what the different numbers on them mean. And then making sure people actually look at the reference sheet so they're trying not trying to hunt for a card that's already either doesn't exist or has already been taken. Like there were aspects of that game that weren't easy to learn, and it's not the best game out there. But for iconography, it it's probably the best game I've ever played. And I don't think you're ever gonna find anyone else out there shouting out Bastille by Queen Games, but hey, we dig it. There we go. Uh good night, Pax. Uh yeah, and one thing I one game that I I agree with, although I haven't played it physically, so I, I hesitate to jump on the bandwagon. I'm waiting for my one deck galaxy to show up, but one deck dungeon is really mm-hmm. straightforward. It's like agility and a dice symbol. It's like, you know, it's it's basic, but that's what it needs. Right. They could have made you they could have gone somewhere more complex with it, but uh, and you know, try to combine things together and they mm-hmm. didn't. They just, you know, here's your stat, here's your die, you know, picture of a die. Here's your, you know, a spell picture of a die. It's all straightforward uh, and makes it really easy to play. No one I remember is one I brought up to your place um, where we hadn't hung out in a long time and I shot you a board game with Zularetto. Remember mm, that one where you yeah. were building the zoo and you were putting the animals yeah. in and you had the the cool, well, cool. I don't know what you call them. They, at the time, they seemed cool. They were really abstract cars with wooden with lines on them. That, that um oh yeah you're gonna get sean upset euro game girl um <laughs> zularetto definitely like just made sense and the the male and female animals and at the end of the round they duplicate and where to place them and the board had little reminders on how, how the pen scored and stuff like that i remember that one being really solid it's not the iconography in card kingdoms of valeria it's the, oh, it's the iconography on those specific cards it's the grammar. i don't know that's still the iconography it's, <laughs> it's where the commas are with the icon yeah it's yeah no i i, I cannot agree with the duke and uh, there what is it the dukes is it or is it no uh, the scoring card the scoring yeah. cards of kingdoms of valeria i take strong exception to everything else absolutely except the scoring cards yeah now what's another one space base 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 is like people get that right away. Although I, you know what I, some of those power cube well, things. That's the cubes. That's not iconography. That's just the power cubes and the text that goes with those. Don't have symbols. Those just have text for what they do when you spend your cubes. Yeah, yeah. the dukes. Yeah, yeah, it's the dukes. I, the dukes. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, there like we go. the See, dukes. Not we just sat me. down with the designer, and the designer literally said, "People tend to get this wrong. This is how this really works." It's so we knew how you it got works. It wrong because you wrote it wrong yes uh yeah the way they worded it's 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 sets of ingre- it's sets of ingredients but you just basically add them all up and divide by two or three or whatever it is yeah. you don't have to have actual sets of three of a kind three of a kind three of a kind three of a kind yeah yeah that, that is the grammar in that particular one yeah and it has frustrated me every time because every time i sit down i think i get this wrong i must do it this way and i've done it wrong the wrong way (laughs) every time all right i think we're probably good for tonight we've got a lot of topics there what do we even cover we had star trek games we talked about um iconography iconography games we want to play more of uh, games too much that scratch theme. RPG itches. Too and much, theme. too much theme. And, uh, Not even just too much. We just kind of yeah, talk theme about and theme. then theme and themes mechanics. and mechanics. Themes and mechanics and iconography. <laughs> oh, Deanna threatened a question. We'll do one more, I guess. I was just—I <laughs> said it at ten thirty. I was going to call it. Yeah. <laughs> I honestly hear your sausage making. The more questions we answer, the harder it gets to promote the individual episode and SEO it because it's too much stuff in one episode and no one can find it. It's silly, but it's... We, and we, we also have a character limit on our uh, and, and, on and YouTube, yes. uh, on the YouTube... Uh, and, and on the notes, notes. like of all things, we, we, we tend to do three to five questions every AMA. Yeah. What was awesome tonight is we didn't have to make up any. Absolutely. Like, like I, did, I didn't have to like go on Twitter and of, grab uh, some question or a question the dice tower was asked. <laughs> We're all good. All right. Well, I that is it 
for our Dog Days AMA. Thank you so much for your questions tonight, lobbyists. And remember, we're here to answer your game and game night questions most weeks. You don't have to be here for an AMA. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. You could go to tabletopbellhop.com and click at the top of the page, the little spot that says Ask the Bellhop. Or you can just hit me up on social media. Just say, you know, tag me on Twitter and say, hey, Mo, I got a question for you. That works, too. Welcome to our review of Point Salad, one of the easiest to learn games I've ever played. So no disclosure here, I picked this one up at a cute little corner bookshop up in Campbellford, Ontario, while on vacation earlier this year. Now, despite being an easy to learn game, it took three designers and developers to nail down how Point Salad works. They are Molly Johnson, Robert Melvin, and Sean Stankiewicz. Artwork comes from Dylan Magni with some design artwork from Sean Stankiewicz as well, who was one of the designers. Uh, you can find Point Salad under 16 different names in even more countries. Uh, this is actually a Korean game originally. But what we're looking at is the North American version, which was published by AEG Alderic Entertainment Group in 2019. Now, Point Salad is a 2-6 player card game that plays in a quick 15 to 30 minutes, depending on the player count and the AP of players. This small box card game has an MSRP of $24.99 US. So Point Salad is basically just a deck of cards. You got 108 different cards that provide you with 108 different ways to score points. Now, these cards are divided evenly between six different salad ingredients. And each turn, all you're going to do is take a card, to keep it for point scoring at the end of the game, or take ingredients to add to your growing tableau, your salad bowl. After all cards are drafted, the players will calculate their individual scores based on the scoring cards they collected and what's in their tableau. Player with the most points wins. That's the basics. There's a bit more to it, which we'll get to in a moment in the How to Play Point Salad part of this review. Before that, though, let's talk about the components in Point Salad, which mm -hmm. you can take a look at in our Point Salad unboxing video on YouTube. So honestly, there's not a lot to see in that video. It's probably one of our shortest YouTube videos we ever put out. As I already mentioned, you get 108 cards. They come in a serviceable dual well plastic card holder with uh, a very short, clear, and organized wool book. Now, the card holder insert is big enough to accommodate sleeve cards, which is a nice touch for people who like to sleeve their cards. And you may want to do this with this game, even if you're not normally a sleever. The cards themselves are two-sided. One side shows a way to score points. The other side shows a single vegetable type out of six. Now, personally, when I opened this, and you'll see this in the unboxing video, I was really hoping the extra well was for a future expansion. So far, such expansion doesn't exist, and it doesn't look like one is coming. Though no. I think we would have both appreciated the bacon expansion for our salads. Yep, still waiting for it. Now, my only complaint with the quality here is big. The cards in this game seem very thin. They have a nice linen finish, but they don't feel sturdy or plasticized like some playing cards are. They actually feel quite flimsy and bend easily when being riffle shuffled. Now, so far, I haven't actually seen any bends or tears after quite a few plays, but I do worry about their long-term durability. And at this point, we have played the game more than 10 times. For a game that plays this quickly and easily, it's odd to see them make this choice. Mm -hmm. Durability is something we will be continuing to monitor and mention during the Bellhop Tabletop segment of our podcast if we do notice any future problems. Yep. So, now that we know what we've got, 108 two-sided cards. What exactly are we doing with them? So you start a game of point salad by paring down the deck for an amount based on the max player counts, for any but the max player count. Player, max player count, you're good to go. You use the whole deck. But other than that, you pair the deck down. Now, this could involve either counting off so many cards to use or removing a set number of cards from the deck and playing with what's left. For example, with two players, you actually just count out six of each veggie but with five players, you instead remove three of each veggie from the deck. Interestingly, at two and three players, the actual rec they actually recommend you also split up the rest of the cards so that for two players, you end up making three decks and playing three full rounds of the mm -hmm. game. And with three players, you actually split the deck in half and play two rounds. Now, note you're not just splitting the deck. You are actually evenly dividing it because you want that perfect information of knowing exactly how many elements. Uh, how many vegetables are there? So you're not splitting the deck into three, you're making 
three sets of decks with all six ingredients. And I got to say, I dig this way to play um, where you're going to play multiple rounds that are quicker, where your point total between all games add up together. Uh, regardless of player count, though, the rest of how you play remains exactly the same. It doesn't matter how many cards are in the deck. Gameplay remains identical. So the next thing you're going to do is now that you have your separated out deck, you're going to shuffle that up really good. Now, you want to really take your time shuffling here because you just had everything sorted. You're then going to split the deck into three even piles. These are placed ingredient side down, so all you see are three point cards. Now, everyone should take a look at these before you start flipping things over to know which cards are out of there. But if it's your first few times playing, just to continue setting up without having everyone to see it. Next, what you're going to do is you're going to flip up two cards from each deck and put them underneath. So you have a total of six ingredients face up, which make your market. And that's it for setup. It probably took you longer to listen to that than it actually <laughs> takes to set up this game. Points out yeah. it is lightning quick to get to the table. Yeah, especially if you sort all your cards by ingredient at the end of each game. That's what I insist everyone I play with do. So that additional initial deck splitting is much quicker. Now, if you tend to always play with six players, you can probably just keep the mix. But for any player count out of that, you're probably going to want to sort everything. So now that you have the game set up, you got three stacks of cards with six card market underneath it. The game begins. Each turn, players do one thing. They either take a point card from the top of one of those three stacks or they take two ingredient cards. If ingredient cards are taken, two new cards are flipped face up, refilling the market, but only after you've taken both cards. It's not one of those ones where the market refills instantly. The drafted cards are placed in front of you in your own little tableau where they're going to stay until the end of the game. Note, there's no shifting around or stealing cards in this game. Your tableau is yours and no one can touch. And that's it. There's two choices. Take a point card or take ingredients. Now, additionally, once you have a point card, players do have the option to flip over one of their existing scoring cards, point cards to its veggie side. And to facilitate that, all of the point cards show what ingredient is on the other side. Now, you can only do those once a turn. Note that you cannot at any time convert a vegetable back to its point side. Right. This is a one-way street. Once an ingredient, always an ingredient. Also, note you can only flip one point card per turn. Something mm -hmm. that could be a problem if you build up too many that you end up not wanting by the end of the game. Now, play continues around the table until every single card is drafted. All decks are empty and the, the market's empty as well. At that point, all you do is add up your points. The point side of every card shows some reward for having some combination of ingredients in your tableau at the end of the game. These exist in all kinds of combinations, from things like two points per carrot to five points per pair of lettuce or eight points for a set of three specific ingredients. There's at least one card that gives you 12 points for a full set of six different veggies, as well as one that gives you points for every type of veggie you don't have. Having an even number of onions and a whole lot more. Remember, you have 108 different scoring possibilities in this game. Now the player with the most points wins. That's it. That's really it. If I was showing you the game, in person, that teach would have been even quicker. This is basically a game I can set up and teach in under 30 seconds. It's that simple to learn. But not quite as easy to play, which leads yeah. me to the next segment of this review. Our thoughts on Point Salad. All right, so let's start off by pointing we definitely aren't the first podcasters out here, the first content creators to discover this game. And people have been talking about Point Salad since it came out. And everything, seriously, everything I have heard has been positive about this game. This isn't some hidden gem we're hoping to bring to light. This is a game that has plenty of press, and all we got to say is that it's all good, and I got to say for good reason. If anything, we're adding a new voice to a game that is perhaps quieted down some and needs a reminder for people that it's still out there. Very true. This is one of those totally brilliant games where once you play it, you kind of wonder, why didn't anyone think of this before? It's just such a brilliant use of two-sided cards used in such an elegant way. The way it's so dead simple to teach. Like, seriously, under a minute for any gamer who's ever scored a game, board game before. Yeah, I expect most gamers will have some real face-slapping moments. In fact, wondering <laughs> why no one did this sooner yeah. or how such a simple concept works out so perfectly. The really impressive part here, too, is how well this dead simple to learn game actually plays and how much actual strategy and tactics are required to play well this is a card game with semi-perfect to perfect information 
at the full player count of six, it's possible to know every card in play. At lower counts, you always know exactly how many of each ingredient are play, but what point cards are removed will be random. Once you get down to two and three players, you're back to that near perfect information because you're going to play with multiple decks that we mentioned earlier. Yeah, now most talking about perfect information, and that is knowing every card that's in the deck before things start. Right. While often perfect information means low randomness, that's not the case no. here. Despite knowing exactly what's in the deck may not help you at all as you don't know the order the point cards mm -hmm. or ingredients will come up. And it's very common that multiple point cards get flipped over in a single round, never to enter play as points again. Yeah, that's very true. You definitely can't sit there counting on specific cards to come up, but you can plan your veggie buys based on the knowledge that there are certain types of scoring cards that exist for each vegetable type. And especially if you're playing the multiple deck, you're going to be like, oh, you know what? That first game, an awful lot of pepper scoring came up. So there's probably going to be less in the next deck, which combined with looking what other people are collecting can definitely affect your odds of getting something useful. Yeah, watching what other people are doing can be a big part of this game. Mm -hmm. And with that comes hate drafting. Often the best move may not be to grab something you want, but rather to take something so that someone else can't have it. Now, I totally agree, though. I never felt the hate drafting felt that hateful. It did, never really felt spiteful. It didn't feel really nasty as it can in some games. And still worth noting, though, because some people are going to be turned off by the fact that there is that level of competitiveness and I guess backstabbing with the hate drafting. I think as with most games where these sort of options exist, whom you're playing with will have a big yeah. impact on the feeling you get from that sort of play. I think in most of the times for in our case, it's been, wow, they're about to get a runaway. We need to stop that. Yes. Um, and that that's it. So it's, it's not specifically stopping them from getting anything. It's stopping them from getting the clear victory. Yes. Now, besides some groups not liking a bit of take that in the card drafting, the only real problem I can see with this game is the card quality we mentioned earlier. These really are thin cards, and, and I, I'm looking forward to seeing how well they hold up. I really hope that I'm talking to you in six months or a year, and I'm like, you know what? We're wrong. Those point solid cards, they're nice and sturdy. I let my kids play with them. They're still great. I, I, I expect this game to see many more plays. We played a lot over this last weekend as we've been enjoying it a lot, so I have a feeling my game's going to see a lot of wear, and we'll have to see how it pans out. Maybe you are going to find a need for that second card, well, to hold sleeved cards after all. Yeah, and I gotta say, that is a distinct possibility. I've, once I do get a fold in one of them or a bend, I'll definitely be looking at sleeving. Overall, we have absolutely been loving Point Salad. This is a truly brilliant game, the likes of which I haven't played in a long time. This reminds me of when we first discovered the Duke and we're just blown away by it, playing game after game after game. Or for back when people who joined us when we first started this podcast, Azul was that game. It felt like every week we were talking about Azul. And I have a feeling that our Bellhops Tabletop segment for months to come is going to have a reference to Point Salad or two. These are all games we continue to play time and time again, even many years after getting them. And I think Point Salad's definitely going to be one of those we keep coming back to. And it's certainly not a large footprint game also. No. So depending on how you lay out your collection, you can probably fit this in at coffee shops, at least for lower player counts. I can definitely confirm it fits at coffee shops and even small tables donated by your venue. To me, Point Salad feels like it could be pretty close to a universal game, a card game that's going to be right for a huge range of gaming groups. It's light enough that party gamers should enjoy it, as should non-hobby gamers and mass market game fans. The thing is that it's also got enough tactical depth that it's going to appeal to fans of heavier games. The exception to this would be people who just hate quick filler games or that cannot abide by any take that elements in yeah. their games. While we found hate drafting common, it never felt nasty, but we know some gamers prefer to have no conflict like that at all in their games. Yeah, at this point, I recommend any game group at least give it a shot. Find a way to do a demo, talk to your local game store, or you can even try it online through Cervante. It's one of their free silver games. So supposedly we can be playing 
points out online. Note, I have not tried it there to know how well it's implemented, but I don't see how you can mess that one up. Now that's it for our review of Point Salad, a super simple to learn game with surprising depth and fantastic use of two-sided cards. Yeah. What's the last game you picked up and thought, we're going to be playing this one for a long time coming? Tell us all about it in the comments below. Now, before I go, I do encourage you to like, share, subscribe, and or follow, depending on where you're watching this. Doing so really does help more people find our content. And I would also like to invite you to check out my written review of Point Salad over at TabletopBellhop.com. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. The Ghost Betwixt, we sat down and finally played through Scenario 2. This was actually our third time playing the game because we kind of did a learning game, which went pretty rough. Uh, and then we played a full scenario. Sean actually took part in that one, didn't you? Yeah. You played the first game, not, the, first, the, not yeah. the full scenario. Yeah. So Sean, sorry, Sean played through the first one, but then we played with the Anatorian Cat, played the second one. Um, this is a game, if any, excuse me, sorry. This is a game that is a modern dungeon crawler set in the haunted heartland. Um, it's also retro 90s, though I honestly really haven't gotten a lot of 90s vibes off it. But it's a retro 90s game where you are playing a family who one of the children has been abducted by someone and pulled into a haunted house, and you are trying to rescue them. Um, despite the cartoony look, that theme gets even darker, and it's very much not a kid's game. So despite the fact it kind of looks Scooby-Doo on the cover, and the fact that I agreed to reviewing it thinking it was Scooby-Doo, that's not quite what this is. So scenario two went better than our first time, um, but long, very long. Uh, it took us close to four hours. Um, part of it, I think, was just luck of what came out. Second was, man, the first room was terrible. Um, and unfortunately, the four hours was actually longer than we had. Um, we kept Tori up. Tori now works on weekends, which stinks for our Friday night gaming and actually kept them out longer than we should have. So the end of that session was very much uh, a rush. We rushed through it, which did impact our enjoyment of it. Um, despite it being our third game, we're still looking up a lot of rules, and there is still stuff we have no answers for that's getting frustrated. And, and I've been looking on Board Game Geek, and I've been trying to find answers, and I know the designer's been pretty good, but I'm trying not to do the thing where we just get all the answers from the designer so that I can review the game on its own merits. And I got to say, the one thing we are completely stuck on is can you sell things to vending machines? Because we found a vending machine and we really wanted to buy some stuff and we have useless stuff now. And there are rules for selling things for one third their price, but it says you will get the opportunity to sell. And in real life, you can't sell things to vending machines. But I know in very many video games, like, you know, Fallout or we're playing Borderlands, you can. And I actually couldn't find an answer. And the frustrating part about this game is I'm wondering if it's in there somewhere. I, I suspect that it's probably not. And I suspect you probably can't, judging by the, the wording. But again, until you reach the point where you go, oh, this is where we are allowed to sell stuff. Now, nah, obviously, you don't know. We can't. yeah. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, that's. I expect that's what's going to happen. I fully yeah. expect that at some point, light will dawn. Oh, look, this is what happens. And this is yeah. where we're obviously allowed to sell. You know, mm -hmm. dude comes out of the wall and says, hey, what do you got for me? Uh, or something. Yeah, uh, I, I, I can totally see it. Because I got to say, it does feel like all the things that are coming up that we're not finding answers to or we're getting confused on are explained eventually. And the, the other huge one that's driving us bonkers is the monster trophies. Because I thought we had figured it out. We got to the point where, like, it's just going to come up later. Just record the monster trophy. Well, this last game, we drew a card that showed monster trophy five times two. And I'm like, wait a minute. So you can have each trophy more than once? And then I'm trying to remember in our first game, I think we got monster trophy two more than once. But when we wrote down, monster trophies we have is two. And I thought that you would just have... That you, you have it or you don't. I thought it was binary and it looks like you have to collect them. So I, we may get screwed out of monster trophies later because we didn't record them properly because it makes no sense. And I just, all I want is a section that says rules that will be unlocked later. Don't worry about them for now. It yeah. just, 
track this. Oh, you're going to see something that tells you to take monster trophies. Just write down the number on this part of your character sheet. It'll be explained later. Or you know what? Eventually you'll be able to sell things. It'll be very clear when you can. Just wait till you're presented with the option to sell. That's when you can sell. Like just a little kind of look ahead. And I get that maybe it's spoilery, but I don't think it would be. Well, I mean, because at this point, what is really required, in my opinion, is someone to sit down and read through all the damn rule books to find all the hidden rules mm -hmm. in there. And that is 100 percent spoilers. Yes. Uh, like it's almost like, OK, I won't play the game. Give me the rule books. And there are three of them. Let's point that one out. Uh, three rule books. Well, there's only one that you don't read all of. <laughs> ah, true. But, you know, you, the other me, two you've already read. But you still you need all playing. three of them. So, I mean, yeah. give me all three of them. I will sit down and offer a couple of days, go through all of yeah. them and see if I can answer your questions, mm -hmm. you know, without spoiling things for you. And that should not be necessary. You shouldn't no, need a shouldn't GM. Be. For this exactly I, I literally am at the point now where i'm really tempted to become the gm of this game i also play a character i guess but like i'm really tempted to just read the entire scenario book and and find the section on monster trophies and find the section on selling and find out what happens at the end of scenario three even though i have a pretty good idea what's going to happen at the end of number three and if what's going to happen at the end of number three is actually what i think then i think there's something wrong on the box and we could have planned things differently and we'll see where that goes like I'm almost at that point. I'm really close to it. I'm just going to sit there and read this. Like, like I won't read every line. I won't read the dialogue, but I'll just to see what some of this stuff means. Yeah. And, and, that's, and, I, and that's a bad place to put any players in because yeah. it's a game that has spoilers. Um, yes. You, you don't want your players to feel yeah, like I don't want to know. I, <laughs> I don't want to know what happened to my brother until I find my brother. Right. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's again, rule books matter. You can yeah. have the best game in the world, but if you can't get your players to understand it without someone who already knows the game teaching them, mm -hmm. there's a problem. And this has three rule books that are poorly organized. Yeah, I, I really get the we never did an actual blind play test because some designers don't realize blind tape test means you're not involved at all. They, they, it's blind. I didn't teach them anything. I just gave them the book and let them play. And answered their questions online. <laughs> right? Like <laughs> anyway, on a more positive note, I I, I don't want to bash the game that much because we're really enjoying it. We're we're enjoying the gameplay. The gameplay is engaging. I really like I forget what they call it. I can't remember the name of their term for exploring, but like the exploration system where you open a door and it feels very hero quested. You're like, boom, I open a door. And then how that works. And what was neat is we did the thing where you put in a room and we spawned two monsters and a treasure chest in the first room, but no doors. And what happens in this game is there's no doors. Those doors are open. So then you spawn more rooms and we ended up spawning three rooms. And one of those had more monsters in it. And this scenario only had four monster groups. Well, all three were in the first room. Like it wasn't one room. It was spread over three rooms, but even the way, the monsters spread over multiple rooms and how that changed our tactics and how much the blocking terrain mattered. And we got to see flying monsters. Oh, I hate flying monsters. Flying monsters are really annoying. That was just really neat. And it made for a super tense start to the game. But yep. that combat was three out of the five hours of the game. <laughs> yeah. You know what? There really is a lot of good in this game. Yeah. I think the game is probably fantastic. The rule books, however, are stopping you from getting to that fantastic. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Maybe it's just because we played so many. We should just give up. Just be like, I don't know what that means. Forget about it. Just keep playing. Like, maybe that'd be better. I don't know. The other thing I noticed that I'm really impressed by is the replayability. Most scenario games, yes, you could replay the scenario, but there's no reason to. There is so much randomness in the layout, the tiles that come out. What happens in each room? One of the neatest ones is this last one. Let's say there were, let's say there were eight rooms. Well, there's question marks. Question marks are something interesting happens in that room. There are only two. It's possible for both of those to come up in the same room. And I don't know my permutations, combinations enough to do them, this math right now. But it's also possible to be in two different rooms. Well, depending on what room they spawn in, you're going to get a totally different game than I am. Because the secret you find in that room might be in a different room. Like we found something hidden behind the toilet. 
How many other people pe found something behind the toilet? We found nothing in the long hallway. Someone else might have found something cool in the long hallway. And that, and the fact of the monster spawn randomly. Heck, that first room we went into, if it had doors, we would have had to fight two monster groups in close quarters. Or if there were no monster tokens there but doors, we would have got some free treasure. We spawned the vending machine in the second room. Spoiler, there's a vending machine. They give you vending machine tokens. It's not really a spoiler. You can kind of tell it's a vending machine token. So there's no spoiler. And just, I'm like, I could totally see completely replaying that entire scenario from start to finish and fully enjoying it as if the first time. Yes, there's some story elements, but honestly, the story was kind of weak. It just kind of led you to a boss fight. So like even that, I'm like, yeah, it led me to exactly what I expected to happen anyway. Yeah, this and this is a big deal for this sort of game. So many of these games, even Gloomhaven for the most part, are one and done. You're going to yeah. play through it. You're going to enjoy it. And it may take you a long time to play through it, but you're more than likely not going to go back to it. Um, yeah, sure. Some of them have some random dungeon things, but, you know, there were even some problems with some of the Gloomhaven random dungeon generator oh, issues. Yeah. And you're, it, it's not necessarily worth the hassle, especially after you've gone through the trouble of playing through the campaign and gotten, you know, a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. So to have a game like this that has that replayability is an important deal. And, yeah. and again, there is more content for this game coming. There is a chapter two. Yes. So I will say it's good that this is here because compared to Gloom, even with a hundred scenarios, you get six in this. So, yes. so that they, they're, 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 it, there is more. I, I know there's a side quest thing because again, I went through the cards. So I think there's 10 total because I think there's four side quests, but I don't know because we haven't unlocked those yet. But just knowing how many cards I looked at. But also price point is significantly yes. different. Significantly different. Yes. Significantly different. I don't know. We're still digging it. Um, our goal is to have a review up before Halloween so people can get this out. So if people want this for their Halloween, uh, the first scenario for Halloween night or try to play through all six in a marathon 38 hour session or something. <laughs> I don't know how long it would take. Um, Sean has read that the the once you get past scenario th three, things get shorter. So I'm I'm actually looking forward to that. Yeah. All right. Next up. Um, actually, I have more to talk about than I planned. So I'm going to cut these a little shorter than I have in the notes because we played a lot of stuff. Uh, I keep wanting to say on the weekend. We went away at the beginning of the week, mm -hmm. but it fe felt like a weekend. Um, so Sunday, we had dinner over at Brenda's and we played the last scenario from the Star Wars Unlocked Escape Room in a Box game that the kids gave us. Uh, this was the secret mission on Jeddah, which seemed to be set just before Rogue One. Now, in this one, you're actually playing the imps trying to find a stolen crate of kyber crystals. Curse you, Imperials, and your thieving ways. Yes. Now, someone had stolen them from us. We had to recover them, and the pilot had crash-landed on the planet. Um, this was fun until we got stuck. Very, very, very stuck. Um, there, we all misinterpreted something that was happening that I don't want to spoil. This was about 33 minutes in. Um, the scenario features a map. That's no spoiler. It's right on top of the box. It's in our unboxing. Now, what's in it is a spoiler, but we're not going to talk about that. All is we have this map. We get to a point where we're exploring the map and we are literally just punching in each coordinate one at a time because we obviously missed something. And we accrued so many penalties that we ran out of time in the first 45 minutes. And then at that point, we were trying anything. And I started punching in clues. Eventually, I learned two things. And again, this is what breaks me about these games, is there was a point where we had to draw cards from the deck. So that's what you do. When you see a number, you draw a card from the deck. And at one point, it said draw data. And we figured it out. D-A-T-A. -A. Oh, okay, I got to draw D and T and A. And I go through the deck. I pull the D, I pull the T, I pull the A. We're playing, we're playing, we're stuck. We don't know what's going on. Well, it ends up there were two A cards in the deck. When you have a deck of things, you don't expect duplicates. And yes, it was clear. The card said the word data. So yes, there's two A's in data. But when I'm flipping through a deck that is not in order, because they don't want it in order because they think that'll be a spoiler because you'll know what numbers are there and which are missing, supposedly, is their argument. And it's a mix of numbers and letters. Why would I have thought to grab a second A? So that was another one where it was a failure of the system and not our logic, in my opinion, which is the whole frustration I've had with this entire pack of three games. There was a clue that was very out of the box and meta 
in the first scenario that to me didn't have anything to do with Star Wars and just had to do with the physical properties of the things I was playing with. And it just took us out of it. So I, how much of this is your experience or lack thereof with this particular system of escape room ish games? If you've done, if you had done more unlock games, would you have been more prepared for this? Do you think? I, I have no idea. <laughs> I really don't. The, the, I'm thinking the one in the hot probably, but that's only if they did that in another game. Like, like I, I don't want to spoil anything. I, I really want to say something about the Hoth one. Um, but like like exit games definitely had that. We played multiple exit games, so I can talk about those. And eventually I learned things like you need to not, you know, throw the box out or the box insert or, you know, don't, you know, miss. Uh, make sure if you, the place you are buying it from, put a price sticker on there. Make sure you remove it because it might be covering up something you need. And And don't. You know, uh, if there's a staple there that looks out of place, there's probably a reason for it. Like I eventually, learned that, and I will say that it is very likely there are some repeating themes in the mechanics of unlock games that I might have learned about. But yeah. I, I don't know. I, I suspect these games um, should probably be treated like crossword puzzles, where every crossword puzzle designer has the tricks that they go back to the trough from. Right? Yeah. You know the the Emerald Isle is eerie as, you know, on all those crossword puzzles by that designer mm -hmm. and, you know, the stuff like that um, uh, is probably a lot of what you're going to see in these games. So my guess would be that some of this or, or, or you know, would have come up again. You know, the next time you do it, it might have you'll you'll realize, oh, if, if it's if you're looking for data, oh, wait, we need to get two A's because that's yeah. how many there are in the word, not just being able to uh do it and you know so i, I think it's unfortunate that that happens but it's i a, think it's, again, a, it's a puzzle I problem it's, yeah but i think it's a failure of this particular box which is marketed to star wars fans and not escape room in the box fans this is actually sold under an a separate sku and it has a different price point than all the other unlock games and it has a completely different rethemed tutorial whereas if you buy any other unlock you get the exact same tutorial in every box well they did a unique star wars one it's a separate app you have to get from all the other unlock games. It's very much this is a separate product for a different market than their regular games. And that's where I think it fails. I shouldn't need to know their game system to enjoy my Star Wars game. That's fair. I don't know. I, this is not obligation. This <laughs> is something we got as a gift. And I don't know if I'll do a review because I tend to only like to review stuff we love. We might. If there's a gap in the schedule, I might talk about this one, but like it's neat, it's interesting, but there were enough frustrations that I can't recommend it now. Yeah, this, the this one feels scenario more, that played well was awesome. It feels more puzzle than yes. game. Uh, and again, puzzle designers have things they do, and it yes. seems like uh, things got caught up in that where you were expecting more Star Wars game and not puzzle with Star Wars yeah. layer. And I got to say, the app integration for this last one was lame compared to the other two. Right. Like, like the the what? Because there's a whole AR element. Um, here, I'll point out this. I'm not going to tell you which one's in, but there's a point where you have to interrogate a droid and it uses an app and it's really well done. That doesn't spoil anything. That It's Star Wars. You talk to a droid. Another one, you literally have to use binoculars to look around, right? And that's just really cool. Well, it, there just wasn't anything really neat in this one. Like they use the app, but it just wasn't that cool. I don't know. I it just we were we did not have fun as a family. <laughs> the, yeah. the, there were arguments. There were no, it's this, and I'm sure it's this. And let me see the card again. Like it just it got to a bad place. Yeah. And as usual, and I say this every time we're doing these, use the hints. We got there, and the hints weren't helping. Mm. Like it was just like, yes, we know that. Yes, we know that. Yeah, yeah, well aware of that. Yep, got it. I know that. Right. Though eventually, I read a hint that helped us with another problem, but. I don't know. I, it, it, there was a leap of logic in this one that I think some people are going to get right away and some people are going to have the problem we had. Right. But just the box overall, I, uh, there was a leap of logic required in this one. And plus that whole data thing, which again, some groups are going to see that and be like, what well, says data? There's two A's. Obviously, there's got to be two cards in the deck. Yep. Or just check, see if there's another A. Like our group of five, no one had that thought. Right. All right. All right. Well, uh, what about the vacation? So uh, not right. the weekend. What happened on the vacation? Not the weekend. I am going to quickly bring up Board Game Geek just so I don't miss anything here because it was <laughs> that much. 
Uh, luckily, we've talked about a lot of these games already. Yeah, so this, this will be quick. This will be quick. This is more listing than... Uh, it wouldn't be the first time we go over midnight anyway. It's just I was hoping to get done by 1130-ish tonight. Didn't happen. Um, By date. There we go. Now I got to find the start of the trip. Nope, there's some Arnak. There's Ghost Betwixt. There's Star Wars. That's it. We only played. We played more than three games this trip, didn't we? <laughs> I don't know. I guess not. That I saw this than but, I thought. Uh... Why am I thinking there's one more? Yeah, I don't have Aldabas on here at all for some reason. Weird. It's forgettable. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Really so, nice. so I don't know what order these are in uh, anymore. It's fine. Uh, we played Brew Crafters, the travel card game. Um, where did we play Brew Crafters? I can't even picture it. Okay. Yes, I remember now. I remember now. So we went to the New Grove Brewery. Um, Here's the story, but not for now. Um, We get to the New Brew Grove Brewery. We get there. We get our table. We order some stuff. um, And then we play Point Salad. So I'll start with Point Salad. We sat down. We started playing Point Salad. And uh, the neatest part about that was our waitress was like, ooh, what are you playing? Like actual genuine interest. Like, what is that? How does that work? Oh, that looks really neat. First time playing two players, we did the split the deck in three thing. So I don't know. I only logged it as one play, but technically we played three three times. I think the scoring when you're playing three decks should be best two out of three. D thinks you should add up the points. The actual rules are add up the points, so D destroyed me. Because I just had a terrible game. My first game was like 12 to 58. Right. And then I won the next two rounds with scores in the 60s, but it was not nearly enough to catch up on that first play. I don't know if I like it two player. D loved it. I didn't like that there were only six of each vegetable. Like right. they just run out too quick. And like soon as someone takes two point cards of the same vegetable, you're like, there's only four left. Like, like the card counting is too easy, but it's just too hard to do that. Well, I'm just going to collect these and hope for the right point card. Never going to happen. They're, the odds of you getting that point card that happens to match the veggies you already have. It was definitely way better than doing way better at, at like grab a point card, then try to get the ingredients that match. It was easier then I'm just going to grab some ingredients and see what happens. So it did change the strategy. Yeah, I can definitely see counting being vital at two. Yeah, um, like I said there's only six of each ingredient. Yeah, yeah. whereas, I, you know, in the games I play, I am not a card counter, never have been. Uh, I just kind of let things go, and, you know, I have managed to win a game. So it's you, you got three players even, you, there's a difference. Yeah. Um, so it's whether or not, so I think at two player, it really becomes a counter's game. It really is. And like, like what happened in the first game is I decided to go carrots. D every point card she grabbed were carrots. So there's six in the deck. She had four point cards. Now these aren't cards that make points for carrots. These are point cards that couldn't convert to carrots. Right. For anyone who just listened to our review. And I'm like, damn it. All the carrots are gone. And like, that was a game where I ended up converting my point cards into veggies just to fit the last three cards you were forced to draft. Right. Oh, there you go. Uh, uh, Sarah in the chat is just like, we just don't count cards, so we're on even ground. Yep. <laughs> I don't know. We both count cards when we're playing. Like, But but with, with two players, you definitely can, and it's easy. Like, it's not even difficult to right. count yeah. cards. And man, are the games quick. Like, the decks just, you end up depleting decks so quickly, and we had to do a lot of that deck shifting, where you're like, you take half the deck and put it in a new row, right. which was kind of annoying. I, I admit I didn't love it, but I liked it. I still liked it, but not as much as playing with more players. That's fair. Much, and not really all that surprising. Yeah. So. But like I said, Deanna loved it. She liked it better two players. So do each her own. Oh, she kicked your butt. <laughs> no, not really. Like no. our end score was within 10 or something, but just that one game, she absolutely destroyed me. Um, then we moved over to um, Brewcrafters Travel Card Game. So this is just part of my, I was, I was trying to play the game in as many breweries as possible. And we were seeing a lot of breweries this weekend because we were doing this whole happy place check-in thing that Tourism Windsor Essex Pelee Island was doing. So we played Brewcrafters. Um, at this point, they moved us over to the bar side. Not that the place has a clear definition, but they moved us from one area of the place to another. Because we literally, they came up and they're, you could kind of tell they wanted to close off this area. We're like, look, we're here for the long haul. Whatever time you're going to kick us out, we're going to be here till then. This is our plan for the night. <laughs> we brought games. Is that cool? And they're like, yeah, that's cool. But if you and I'm like, and if you want us to move, we will. They're like, yeah, we're going to set you up over there, which was fine. And then our waitress went home, so we cashed out with her and then started up with a different waitress and everything. And we played Brewcrafters. Brewcrafters is good two player. Um, it was very close. Deanna got lucky in the last round. I thought I had it. I, I was making six points per ale, which is awesome in that game. 
Yeah, we played that one quite a bit. Um, so that was that was the second play. Um, I don't even know. We did play. Uh, this is going to be shorter than I was thinking when I started thinking about <laughs> it. Uh, we did play more point salad. I can't remember if we played it more that night. So we did do some more point salad. Point salad definitely would have fit on our very small table. Um, the next morning after our adventure at, at the Grove. Um, so the last time we stayed at Jack's, they used to have this small table, but big enough to fit some games on it. And we're like, oh, they took the table away. Well, they remember that there was a note on our file. Because I don't know, we were the Karens who complained about the table, probably. It's probably one of those notes, but whatever. Um, so we show up this time and they gave us a table, and I sent Sean a picture of this. And it is like the smallest little round folding table that sits low to the ground. It's like the thing you put your coffee on while watching TV, or you'd have your ashtray there, is what it kept making me think yeah, of. Yeah. It was the ashtray table. Um, so we're like, okay, I don't know what's gonna fit. So we grabbed the Duke. And the board literally seemed like it was designed for the table. Yeah, it, it like the perfectly cor- it the corners fit. in there. Yeah. It, it just fit the corners of the Duke. And actually, the Duke's what we did for breakfast. We we sat down. We had picked up pastries. It was your morning previously. tea game. Yeah, it was our tea game. It really was. Except this wasn't a tea game. Which is what I'll get to in a second. Um, So I had picked up donuts at Colasanti's. Deanna had picked up some date squares from Christie's. And we they have curry machine in the place. So... We curried up some coffees and that's what we did in the morning. And we played the longest. It wasn't the longest game of the Duke ever, but it was a two and a half hour game of the Duke one game. And it was close. Like it wasn't, it was just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And we're like, we had plans. Like this was supposed to be, we're going to sit here and we're going to have coffee and donuts because we're going to have a big lunch. Right. And I need to take some pills with food. That's only, otherwise we probably just would have skipped it. But, Coffee and donuts so that I can take my pills and we'll play all round of the Duke and then go do a thing. And and like, I, I think it was two and a half hours. Like it was long, but man, it was close. Like it was like, oh, I think he got me. I think he got me. Wait, okay. If I do this and neither of us were really doing the, the trade pieces, like no one was taking anything. So it was a lot of stalemate, a lot of flipping it. And man, some of the powers in the Duke, we, I have never used command. You played enough Duke where yep, you flip yep. it to move a tile. I put her in guard so many times with command where I'm like, I'm just going to drop my Oracle on you. <laughs> and that was a thing. We're <laughs> like, so yes. And that's probably true. I'm not going to repeat that one for the podcast. <laughs> um, so yeah, long, longest game of the Duke ever, not really, but it was a really long, enjoyable game of the Duke. I did take it in the end, but it was, it was a close game. Yeah. So yeah, we, we got into play of the Duke. Uh, just the base set, because I have a bunch of the expansions and I never actually play with any of them. Yeah. We were actually talking about making getting a separate box to put them in because they're heavy. And while we were walking with this at one point, so I'm like, I don't mm-hmm. know, this is a little heavy. Um, We played some more points salad, I know. Um, But the other thing is we ended up back at the Grove. And Sean kind of knows why, because we kind of hinted at this. But our plans for Tuesday were completely ruined. By uh, everywhere in Ontario changing their their hours this Monday. So everything we had planned to do got negated. And the place we were at the night before was still open. So we went back. So we ended up back at the same place, this time just for more drinks. And we played a bunch of Aldabas. And I, I all I want to say about it, we, I was right. Like, like, I could tell there was a game there, but there's a learning curve that's very annoying to get over. And there's a mechanic there some people aren't going to like, which is the mechanic Tori didn't like. So this is a tableau building game of outdoors that has a really neat theme that doesn't matter and is has confusing design. We're talking about good design and iconography. This is bad design and iconography. The most prominent thing on these cards is the color of the door. It is probably the least important piece of information on the card. All the color matters is when you're putting them down, you can't put the same color door next to each other. Why that is the most prominent, bright, in-your-face part of those cards makes no sense to me. The suit's hidden in the corner. The What the suit does is a little tiny symbol Deanna can't even see uh, without a magnifying glass. And then the ability of the doors at the bottom, and they must be really proud of their art in the middle because, again... That can tell you something, yeah, if but you not memori- as clearly. If you memorize the the different iconography, Icons, it's not really, yeah. but the, it, artwork. The, the artwork on the doors, 
you can play it using at those it, it does give you the information but yeah. it is in no way obvious. it's not tied to it what has it does to be though. memorized it's pure yes. memorization you have to remember oh the cards with two fish are the ones that let me do this right Oh, and it's, the two a, it's fish a lion, and you know it's a yeah, full the lion. Head. All the soldiers are lions, but yeah. the, the the young thin lion lets you put coins on a card. The big main lion lets you bank a card. Like yeah. that shouldn't be what you're doing. No, and they, there's no way to to know what the knockers mean without memorization, yes. and that's just not an option and, for most players. Yes, and we've <laughs> now played enough. I should memorize them, and I still don't know them. Yeah. Like I still got to look at the top left corner. Yeah. And then there's the vault thing. They give you this cardboard vault that you cover over one card, but during the game, you shove stuff under it, including wooden tokens that are like quarter inch thick and one eighth of an inch thick. And you end up your, your vault gets lifted up like. And the vault is also your player reference for scoring. Yes. Which two players was fine because we each took a vault and a player reference. Right. Um, But all that negativity once you get all that down the game gets really good right. it is a really tight two-player i don't even know race I, I guess it's a race to points like it was one of those games where because of the amount of hidden information because stuff does get stored in the vault as long as someone stored anything in their vault during the game you no longer have the perfect information you also don't know what cards are in their hands but that's not important where it's it's the i literally am sitting there going I could end the game. Do I have the win? I don't know. And I'm looking at everything that's in play and I can do all the math for what's in play and I can go, I've got it. But I know she banked four cards. What are they? And just by banking four cards, that affects so many things because it's area majority for suits. It's um, she might have the one. So the, every card she's banked is worth points or she might just have all these nobles, which is this total number of cards in play. Like, there were so many factors, and, I, and, and in that particular case, I ended it, and I shouldn't have. I should have played the one card that was in my hand, which would have let me bank two more cards. She still would have won, probably, because she probably would have ended it. But then if D drew it out and I had one more turn, maybe I could have got more points. But honestly, that's a fantastic decision place. That's where I want to be playing a card game like this. I want to be sitting there doing all the math in my head going, oh, I don't know. I could do this, and it might work, or it might not, and that was actually fantastic. And, and adding up that score was great. This is another one where I think it might be better in a digital implementation. Yes. Where things are managed for you and you don't have to worry about, you know, hiding things underneath the, yes. the vault or, you know, deal. And you, you can mouse over and, and you don't have to worry about trying to figure no, out the true. iconography. Um, there, there, it is a good game. Um, and uh, it, it's just suffering a bit in... in Trying to get to the point of realizing that it's a good yeah, game. It's just there's so many weird design, questionable design choices. I, it, it's odd. I, I find it very odd. Like I said, the most prominent info on the cards is the least useful. That's just backwards. Yeah. Now, the most interesting part of all of it, and I can't find a rule that says otherwise, is if you play two players, as long as you get in at least one card of every suit, everyone scores everything, which is interesting. Like that's a twist from the two player. Because it's whoever's in first and whoever's in second. Right. And yes, you have to have at least one card of every type in play for that to happen. And that really changed the dynamic of the game. And multiple times, what did we play? Three or four games. But multiple times, I would get second or D would get second and score more than the person in first. Because right. she didn't have the majority of the suit, but had enough of the point scoring stuff that it was still worth it which just felt odd. I couldn't decide if I liked it or not. D thought it was cool. I was like, I don't know. And I almost wonder if playing two players, you should only score first. Right. And I, I didn't see anything in the rule book that said for two players, change how you play. Yeah. And I'm not seeing anything uh, in there. I mean, in solo, if you tie, you both score. Uh, if you tie, you score the full. Um, yeah. You both score the full. Yeah. So yeah. D thought it was neat. Because you have to play balanced, right? You yeah. want to have at least one card of every suit just in case. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Which did affect it. But it found it also made the bank a card way more powerful. Oh, yeah. Like, the, there was definitely a dynamic change. And I will say we did not have a problem where the person who banked the most coin just won straight up. 
that did not become an issue, even though one game I banked 10 and D banked three. Right. Like it, it, she won by other means. <laughs> so game is definitely growing on me. It's, 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 I'm, I'm going to start calling it the side effect. It's those first two games were just overwhelming and confusing and too many icons. And many players are going to give up at that point. It's not going to be worth it for them to keep playing. What I'm hoping I get to as a game teacher is a place where I can explain the game better that makes that first play more enjoyable. Right. And yes, I know the game shouldn't need an expert game teacher to make it fun, but it will help anyone I teach to play the game have more fun next time, I would hope. Yeah, no, that's fair. Now, speaking of the one mechanic is the steal money mechanic. Steal money mechanic in that game can very much feel like you miss a turn. And that's what happened to Tori. It's, I planned ahead, I'm going to do this thing, can't wait till my turn, I've got my coins, boom, I'm gonna, oh, you stole my coins. Well, I can't do this now. See, now it's what? interesting because I, well, I think part of Tori's problem was he kept forgetting that the two, two cards are free. Yeah. And I, I, think that, uh, I think that may have colored his experience. Now, I don't know. I know, I know Tori well. I, I think I know Tori well enough that he's probably not going to recover from not liking the game. No, If he's chosen, he doesn't so. like it. He doesn't like it. But I do have a, a sneaky suspicion that he kept forgetting that there those cards were free that you don't need cards so it's he was possible. planning he was planning uh, and 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 relying on a financial solution yeah. when he had more options than he was really evaluating i don't know it, it happened to me where d did it to me three times in a row and i was frustrated yeah. i'm like this sucks i'm That's like fair. i'm gonna do this thing oh screw it and yeah i can grab a card Yay, I got another card. Right. All right, it's your turn. I take two coins. Ugh. Okay, sure. You took those two. Okay. Yeah, I guess I'll take this card. Like, it, it literally gave me, like I said, it took me a bit to put it together when we were talking about it. And I'm like, no, it's that miss a turn feeling. It's that, yeah, I don't get to play this round. You guys go have fun. Right. Even, yes, I got a card out of it. So what? Like, unless it happens, those one and two cards are really needed for my next move in my strategy. But we definitely had a problem with card draws. Like there was a time where there's nothing in the market either of us wanted. And I had a problem with the colors of the cards where I had a round where all five cards in my hand were blue. And of course I had blues already in my tableau and I'm like, I can't play anything. All five cards in the market, blue. Like it just locked. It just came up that way. But you would think with three different colors and it's not like we sorted them by color at any point. Yeah, no, so that was a little annoying, but that was affecting both of us, so that wasn't as bad. But but getting screwed on money three times in a row definitely like there was some some frustration there. That's fair. That's you no, know, that's definitely fair. And I got to say that's what happened to Tori, right? Like I think it was four or five for him, so it would have been even worse. Right. Okay, well, I think we'll stop there. That that's pretty much that's pretty. There was more point salad. We tried to play Brewcrafters three times today, going to three different breweries, but uh, again, everywhere in Ontario seems to have. Literally somewhere we were at last week was no longer open on Wednesdays today. So, <laughs> All right, well, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right, so my notes say, for those folks who joined us Sunday, I got to open up some packages. Um, now there's three more. So I have lots of stuff to open. Um, so that means there's going to be unboxing videos. So just off the top of my head, uh, there's Smash Up Disney, Mountains Out of Mohoyles, Ven, Disney Sorceress Arena, Disney Sorceress Arena Expansion. All games I'm itching to check out and I want to play and I kind of want to bring some on vacation with us, but I need to unbox them because I like unboxing videos live and making videos so people can see them. And I like being able to be in our review and say, hey, check out our unboxing video. So that needs to happen. Now, I do also have a pocketbook adventure. So this is a a fantasy RPG themed book in a little spiral bound notebook thing. It looks really cool. That does not need unboxing. So I'll probably find time to check that out. Um, Friday, Cat and Tori, we should be good to game. I don't see any reason it's going to get interrupted. And technically, Tori doesn't even have to work the next day because it's a long weekend here in Canada. Um, so we are hoping to get through the next chapter of Ghost Betwixt. And it would be awesome if we could get through two. If we can finish three and four to kind of get ahead of things, that would be awesome. Or we'll play one, and if we have time, I really want to teach them Cowboy Bebop Space Serenade. So that's on my list. So I know Scenario 3 is going to be a big one. So I want to finish Scenario 3 of Ghost Twix. That's a definite for Friday, and hopefully fit in something else. Uh, Cowboy Bebop would be good. Um, we're on the fence about teaching the kids Cowboy Bebop. 
because they have zero, like absolutely no reference. But I'm kind of curious to find out how that impacts the game. Yeah, I, I think that's actually a a, a not a valid knowledge point. Yeah, uh, you know, so because I so mean, that might be one of your kids is gonna, your kids are probably going to fight over the, the miniature with the, do- the dog. Uh, yeah, that's true. Um, you know, it's uh... that's if I get my youngest lately is is definitely we we don't force the kids to play games. We talked about this with kids. Like if you're a gamer and you want your kids to game, that's great. Don't force them to sit down. She's 100 percent video game land lately. So we go over to Brenda's, we have dinner, like, we're going to sit down and play a game. She's like, oh, I'm going to go play on Holly Switch. So I wish we give her the option. That's fine. So she may or may not. But yes, if, if both of them were playing, it'd be awesome if Genevieve joined us again. But lately she has been she has been turning down board game night to do things of her own, like paint rocks. So it's not just that. There you go. Well, that's quite the wealth of material lined up for our listeners with even more coming what do people yes. want to hear about first? Let us know in the comments or on our Discord. Actually, you know what? For next week's review, right here. Well, we're going to open this up to the chat. We got a good group here. They've been active all night. I want to know what you want me to review next Wednesday. I could easily do Chiseled, or I could do a formal review of Star Wars Unlocked. Like, you got kind of my thoughts on Star Wars Unlocked, but I'll break it down. I'll tell you who the designer was. I'll give you the MSRP. I'll go through some of the mechanics and how they work, the stuff that's open and obvious or i will review chiseled and now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our vip guests our patreon backers we greatly appreciate their support Dukas, thank you evil john thanks john donna thank you so much for all the interaction we eat this stuff up valentine peace thank you valentine mechanical muse thank you well that was the double bell that means our shift's coming to an end and we're gonna have to lock those front doors though the doors are closed you can always find us at tabletopbellhop.com all over the web it's tabletop bellhop one word and on your podcatcher of choice digging the show you can also support us at patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and get some pretty cool bonus stuff like access to our show notes and even bonus audio. Well, that wraps up the sh- time we have tonight. Thank you, lobbyists, for joining us. Welcome to stick around in our penthouse suite for the after show unboxing. Yes, for the lots of Bell unboxings. Hub, for the Tabletop Bell Hub Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Game on. <laughs>